everybody labeled participant is really helpful from our end on tab because we are going to be removing observers from the round today uh, just in order to get everything as lag free as possible. We do have live streaming event or live streaming links that are available on the front page of tab room if anybody has parents or uh, teammates who want to watch that will actually probably have a better faster video so that's the best way for them to do that anyway. Um, do we know, do we have all the participants in this room? Um, I, can, I can do a roll call. Oh, that's that would be what, great. Next order of business actually. Okay, so um, if you could just verbally or raise your hand, confirm that you are here, preferably verbally. Um, and then also correct me if I don't say your name right. My apologies in advance. Sydney Burns. I'm here. Uh, Suni Gandhi. Here. John Lee. Uh, here. Isaac Blackburn. Here. Emma Sedlak. Syed Fatmi. Here. Isaac Slevin. Here. Um, Sonali Chandi. Here. Uh, Rachel Pontes. Here. Max Rosen. Here. Florence Shen. Here. Michael Kaiser. Here. Caitlin Maher. Here. Genevieve Cox. Here. Elena Martinez. Here. Andrew Sun. Here. Isha Barua. Here. Okay, we do have everyone here. And Ursula. Yeah, what's up? Um, is there any other housekeeping stuff I need to go over? Or are we ready to like pass things over to the presenting officer? We're ready. Okay. As cool. long as you have everybody you need to have. We do. Um, Judge uh, Jared Sutton, did you have a quick paradigm that you wanted to give everyone? Jared? I was absolutely on mute. I've been doing that at work all week. Um, um, just really quick, um, congratulations on being here. I can handle speed. Please make sure all your arguments are well sourced. And when you're refuting, you refute warrants, not claims. Um, and if you're refuting with, if you're refuting something, you need to have evidence that I can weigh. Um, make it easy for me as your judge. Good luck. I know this is really strange, but congratulations. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Sultan. Then with that in mind, I'm going to pass. Thing. If there's no more questions, going once, going twice, sold. Um, if there's no more questions, we're going to pass things over to our presiding officer for today's session, Michael Kaiser. Hi, everyone. That's Representative, or sorry, Senator now, Kaiser. I'm very happy to be presiding over the session today. And I just want to say once again, congratulations for everyone to making it to this round. I actually wanted to start off today's session with a moment of silence for all of those affected by the coronavirus around our country and in our world. Thank you. We wish them well. So I'll get right into my procedure. I try to be as fast and fair as possible. So when picking both speakers and questioners, I'll first pick randomly, then based off precedence, then recency once it's established. For my timing of speeches, I'm NSDA standard. So when we hit two minutes, I'll raise this placard. When we hit two minutes and 30 seconds, I'll raise this placard, two minutes 55, this placard. Then at 3.05, I'm going to raise this placard indicating that you should conclude your speech. And if you don't at 3.10, I will verbally cut you off. For questioning blocks, when you hit 25 seconds, I will then count you down going five, four, three, two, one, and then I will call for the next questioner. When I call on you, I'm either going to say unmute your mic or you have the floor so you know what I'm saying. Um, also, when you guys have questions or when you're being called for on speeches or for voting, just raise your placard up high so that I can see you and count you. However, if you have a motion or a point of personal privilege, raise your placard along with your hand so that you don't disrupt the debate, but I can still call on you. Are there any questions about my procedure? Okay, great. Seeing none, we can get started with debate. Are there any motions on the floor? Motion. 
Representative Senator Rosen. Motion to open the floor for DACA nominations. That requires a second, just raise your placards. Okay, assuming unanimous consent, the floor is now open. Nomination. Nomination. Oh, okay, Senator Rosen. I nominate docket A consisting of the following. First, um, tariffs. Second, unsettling times. And third, CDFI reform. Okay. Are there any other nominations? Motion. Senator fought me. I move to I move the floor to close, or excuse me, I move to close the floor for docket nominations. That requires second. a second. Please raise your placards. Assuming unanimous consent, the floor is now closed. All right, so let's get started on. And our first item is going to be a bill to reform sections 301 through 310 of the Trade Act of 1974. <clears throat> All right. Do we have a sponsor on this piece of legislation? Please raise your placards. Senator Mayer, you have the floor. I think the chair, just give me one moment. My judges, that's Senator Mayer, spelled M-A-H-E-R. This is my first time speaking and so glad to be kicking off this round. Just let me know, smile, nod whenever you're ready. Be awesome. And speaking of kicking off, um, to the observers in the room, I will be kicking you off of the entire video call <laughs> um, in about five seconds. Could you please go to the YouTube um, recording of this where this is streaming live? You'll probably have better video quality as well. So with that being said, see ya. Okay, you're good, Mayor. Awesome, just wanted to make sure. Good from all judges. Fantastic. Earlier this year, US President Donald Trump proposed a 100% tariff on wine, saying, and I quote, I don't like French wine anyway. Now, this was naturally met with outrage across the board, but I find it especially ironic because Trump's own winery in my home state of Virginia boasts the largest French vines on the entire East Coast. Now, I'm no fan of our president's contradictory policies, especially when it comes to his capricious trade actions, but it's time for this Congress to stop whining and start taking fruitful action. First, let's understand the problem in the status quo. Section 301 of the U.S. Trade Act of 1974 authorizes the president to take all appropriate action to obtain the removal of any policy of a foreign government that violates an international trade agreement or unjustly restricts U.S. commerce. The National Law Review writes on August 1st of 2019 that while Section 301 has laid mostly dormant for almost two decades, President Trump has impulsively and unilaterally utilized the authority to initiate high profile trade actions against China India, and most recently, France, all without congressional oversight. But in giving the president unilateral authority to issue tariffs, Section 301 subverts not only this Congress, but also the World Trade Organization. Even though the US has committed itself to pursuing the resolution of disputes through the WTO dispute settlement mechanism, Section 301 doesn't require the US government wait until it receives authorization from the organization to take enforcement actions. But President Trump's recent invocations of Section 301 put us at unprecedented odds with the WTO. International studies expert Aaron Dune explains on December 18th of 2018 that as US legitimacy in the WTO wanes from its failure to engage with the organization's dispute mechanisms, China is playing an increasingly active role in giving itself greater clout in the organization and reshaping the WTO to fit its own interests. This serves as a frontal assault to America's leadership in the liberal international order with a variety of severe consequences for our economy and business environment. As a framework, we need to pass legislation to regain WTO legitimacy and hold our president accountable. My legislation does exactly that. Section 1A prevents the president from taking unilateral retaliatory action against a foreign government, instead requiring that such actions need legislation passed by a majority of this Congress. Then, Section 2 lays out the new processes that a Section 301 claim must follow. Section 2A requires investigation and deliberation from the USTR, and Section 2C creates a necessary exemption for the AUMF. I don't need to tell you that we live in unprecedented times. Just look at how this Congress is meeting. 
But I do believe that during these times, we have the unique opportunity to set a precedent of accountability. Trump can sit in his winery in Virginia, crushing grapes into wine, but it's time this Congress stops letting his political rhetoric intoxicate us or will crush the fruits of democracy across the globe. Thank you, Representative Mayor, for that speech of three minutes and eight seconds. All questioners, please raise your placards. That's gonna go Representative Cox, followed by Representative Chandy, followed by Representative Blackburn, followed by Representative Flippin. So you say that we basically we need to regain our legitimacy in the WTO. And I agree with you that it is decreased when President Trump unilaterally attacks other countries. But today, does today's legislation also prevent him from doing things like insulting world leaders? So I would agree with you that it doesn't prevent him from doing that, but it does prevent him from taking these unilateral actions, such as passing tariffs on his own. You cut off the actions and his and his rhetoric simply cannot stand on its own. Sure, but doesn't he also do other things like insulting world leaders, which also delegitimize his sure. But today we solve one problem. Under your legislation, the USDR has to make a decision in 45 days. But where does in the legislation does it say that Congress has a time limit as well? It doesn't specify that Congress has a time limit as well, but the fact that the UST, the fact that the USTR has this 45 day limit to be able to deliberate on this doesn't is incredible. That also mean that that can increase Congress's inefficiency because now we don't have a time limit to make decisions as well. Representative Chandy, I believe that in all cases, Congress having more time to deliberate and discuss this is far better than erratic, irrational action. Senator Blackburn. Okay, so you mentioned that there's a dispute resolution process within the WTO, so we don't have to use Section 301, right? Correct, yes. Okay, so what are special 301 amendments? I'm sure you could tell me what you would So need. aren't those amendments used to enforce intellectual property laws that are outside WTO frameworks? Sure, but what I'm telling you is that- So we, we don't actually have an alternative within the WTO, right? Wait, no, we do have an alternative within the WTO. Because once we create, once we create a- But the WTO the United doesn't States, cover these intellectual- Right now, China is the one creating thing. this legislation. Thank you. So how effective is Congress at passing trade, trade legislation? I can understand what you're saying, that there's going to be a bit of a delay, but I would prefer any sort of delay where Congress gets to deliberate and the USTR has that process over sure, the but, unilateral- what, what, but when there's a delay in trade policy, doesn't mean that the United States becomes a step behind in the trade wars we're trying to fight? Wait, no. I think that the United States trade wars have been adversely impacted by our president unilaterally and erratically issuing these policies. I think we need slower, sustained action that is Question accountable. Question has elapsed. Please mute your mic. Thank you. Seeing as that was a speech in affirmation, all negation speakers, please raise your placards. Senator Martinez, you have the floor. And then before... Morning. Before Senator Martinez um, starts, uh, Jared, our judge, can you hear me? I can. Um, can you please keep your camera on through the entirety um, of the session? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Um, sorry about that, uh, Senator Martinez. Right, good morning. I'm Senator Martinez. I'm speaking on the negation of this bill. Whenever my parliamentarian, PO, and judges are ready, give me a thumbs up and I'll be happy to begin. Great. He always always ready. Thank you so much. Many Americans liken the Trump administration's daily agenda to a satirical Saturday Night Live skit. I would disagree. It's a lot more like whose line is it anyways when there's a lot of improvisation and ridiculous questions get equally ridiculous answers. But no one is laughing when our president puts our international credibility on the line. While this bill hopes to settle his unpredictability, it fuels his irrationality instead. Fail this piece of legislation. First, fail this piece of legislation because it empowers reckless trade decisions. Ms. Mayor, Senator Mayer tells us that when we pass today's legislation, Trump now has an imperative to go to the U.S. trade rep and have his actions investigated and approved by Congress, creating better transparency in the decisions he makes. But that's quite the opposite. It's only going to push him further towards other officials that can act without investigation, decreasing the transparency on his actions. The first one being Secretary of Commerce Wilbur Ross. As Keith John Johnson writes for Foreign Policy on February 20th of 2020, he explains that Wilbur Ross was responsible for implementing steel tariffs on China throughout the trade war, and his department's authority has now been expanded to levy tariffs on countries that have been manipulating currency. Now, the Department of Commerce's authority has been overstepped. These authorities are supposed to belong to the United States Trade Representative, but because there's less accountability by going through the Secretary of Commerce, that's why President Trump utilizes him so much. We're not going to see the same levels of transparency after we 
pass today's legislation. It'll only increase the lack of accountability we have on the executive. But then we move on to the second figure, who is the most important, Peter Navarro, the man behind the Ivanka Trump designer label curtain. He is in charge of the Office of Trade and Manufacturing Policy. And as economic policy expert Annie Lowry writes in the December 2018 issue of The Atlantic, Navarro is responsible for by directing Trump to take on the madman approach like President Nixon, where he makes other countries think he's irrational and volatile to scare them into conceding. Now, Senator Mayer conceded to Senator Cox in questioning that we're not going to stop Trump from from initiating rhetoric over Twitter and starting trade wars and essentially being the leader that has damaged our credibility in recent years. And we're going to see that expand as we have less accountability because we've pushed President Trump towards other officials. But let's take the affirmative at their highest ground and say that this does work. Here's why that's still a problem. Now curb your enthusiasm because this gets a lot worse. Today's legislation does not allow for timely responses. As the Center for New American Security explains on June 27th of 2019, Congress also needs to ensure that presidents have sufficient discretion to take temporary measures that impose tariffs in response to genuine threats, such as ensuring military preparedness and responding to emerging pervasive trade abuses. President Trump will not be able to act quickly enough if he needs the action to do so. We need a quicker method of vetting that also ensures transparency. Today's legislation is not that answer. We can continue to allow this Congress to be a caricature of its original purpose when we pass this bill, but it'll be politicians like Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping that get the last laugh. Thank you, Representative Martinez, for that speech of three minutes and two seconds. All questioners, please raise your placards. Senator Barua, followed by Senator Sedlak, followed by Senator Mayer. Thank you. So I heard that you were talking about how we forced Trump to go to other organizations. Yes. Aren't other multilateral organizations better alternatives to the Trade Act? So basically what I'm saying, and we mean multilateral, you mean like the World Trade Organization, right? Right, and the International Monetary Fund. I understand that. What I the, the problem I want to highlight is that President Trump is going to other officials to direct him on trade. Okay, policy. so wouldn't you argue that other officials are better than what we have right now, which is just President Trump? I'm saying that. Senator Isn't that increase? Senator Martinez, great speech, but I'm still a little bit confused. If Trump is already turning to other officials, what changes under the passage of this legislation? because he understands that this legislation will make it harder for him to direct the United States trade representative, he's going to go to Wilbur Ross. He's going to go to Peter But if he's Bar already going to Wilbur Ross, like what actually changes? We're just holding the US trade further. representative accountable. It pushes him further because there's zero vetting when he goes to them. And today's legislation pushes him farther. He already retaliates to Congress when we try Senator to like, cross off from overstepping his power. Hi, Senator Martinez, fantastic speech. So just a question, can these other officials actually take any policy actions like enacting tariffs? Yeah, they did. I just said Secretary Wilbur Ross initiated steel tariffs on China. That's not- sure, but that was with the that. president. Sure, but that was with the president's executive authority. Once you strip the executive of having that authority, they're just advisors, right? We're not really doing that because we're only stripping- no, wait, that's the literally what section A does. Trade representative. Section A says that President Trump can no longer unilaterally do that. Without that, his advisors can't push him towards doing Thank action. Also are there any further system. questioners? Seeing none, the chair will absorb the remaining questioning block. Please mute your mics. Thank you. Seeing as that was a speech in negation, all affirmation speakers, please raise your placards. Senator Gandhi, you have the speech. I thank the chair. This is Senator Gandhi, spelled G-A-N-D-H-I, speaking for the first time this session. Um, as always, give me any indication for all of those above me when you're ready, and just give me a second to pin my PO. One judge, second judge, partly good. All right, feel great, awesome. Politics is always a game of trade-offs, making decisions for some to take from others. But when trade policy treats our citizens like currency, the negation supports a catch-22 where it would rather gamble with the lives of Americans than lay their cards out on the table. Pass today's legislation because we aren't in the business of supporting the popular, but our populace. The first reason you affirm is because Congress helps keep the president in check. You already know the trade representative serves the president's interests with no input from Congress, but this makes their positions much more volatile. It enables them to take rash decisions like Senator Meyer's French wine tariffs that are politically popular for the president, but not necessarily the smartest ones. And this has happened on an even wider scale. The Atlantic in December of 2018 cites that for Bush's administration, 
The steel industry's plight created a political opportunity that was too good to miss. The political incentives to favor protectionism were so enticing because Bush could literally go into Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, West Virginia, and say, I'm the president that saved your job just to gain votes. This completely politicizes trade relations. And that's how we got started in the trade war in the first place. The problem is inconsistent trade policy is extremely damaging to businesses. You end up costing billions of dollars when you switch from president to president. Senator Chandy, Slevin, and Martinez, the same delay that you're so worried about is actually a benefit for the affirmative. By forcing the president to be reliant on Congress, you ensure a slow and deliberate movement towards better trade policy. Political favors should not sway economic policy. But the second reason you affirm is because you give more regional attention to issues of trade. Because right now there's a disconnect between the desire for national security and the pressure of domestic industry. There's no pathway for municipalities or states to advocate for better trade policy because they don't have any direct line of communication to the trade representative. But this legislation makes a fair, better economic policy that also makes sure that the political tensions don't spill over to the economic sphere. A lot of political bouts are temporary. So by extension, the economic tariffs and sanctions that are placed are too. So Senator Martinez, this is why the deliberation from Congress is so beneficial. 538 explains in March of 2018 that tariffs come with considerable costs and risks, but making the gambit works work requires a well-defined goal and a winning strategy, unlike most of the temporary politics of Washington. The problem is there's two big problems with these kinds of tariffs. There are the raw economic costs because tariffs, even in short term, are harmful. The Tax Foundation tells us in February of 2020 that the tariffs imposed so far by the Trump administration would reduce long term GDP by 58 billion, wages by 0.15%, and eliminate 180,000 full time equivalent jobs. But the second problem is they create more uncertainty about the future of economic policy, where people think the economy is doing worse than it actually is. And Senator Martinez, with the example that you cited, where you push officials to have more power in the administration, those are isolated incidents where the Secretary of Commerce only has authority on currency manipulation, which are generally not as harmful as overall tariffs that the president has the authority to do right now. For the millions of people whose economic interests are thrown aside because they haven't been politically important, today's legislation gives an accessible pathway for our citizens to voice their opinions. America should not, cannot, and will not become an oligarchy where those who speak the loudest gain the most. Thank you, Representative Gandhi, for that speech of three minutes and six seconds. All questioners, please raise your placards. Senator Fautenby, followed by Senator Shen. Oh, it's the first in that. Oh, excuse me, never mind. All right, hi, Representative. So when specifically talking about Section 301, Section 301 investigations are like what makes sure that a country is violating like our trade laws, right? So then when they when we do retaliate, it's justified because they did like make the first move, right? So the yes and no. So here's that's what the intent of the act was supposed to be. But the problem is because the US trade representative serves at the behest of the president, the president can direct right. start looking right. whether it's Congress like or the president, we're still going to act pretty harshly in terms of retaliation. Right. Let's talk about politicized trade wars. You say that the president is biased, right? Yeah. What makes the Senate better in any way? Aren't we just as much in gridlock? Okay, so that's what I'm saying. The gridlock is actually beneficial because you actually ensure that you hear both sides of the equation before you go forward. Okay, so what I happens when the conservative dominated Senate will be able to pass whatever they want when it comes to trade wars? That's completely partisan. Right, that's totally possible. But what I'm saying is at least you have to have a guaranteed outcome. Oh, but it happened. Okay, you're not guaranteed. Any time has elapsed, please mute your mics. Thank you. Seeing as that was a speech in affirmation, all negation speakers, please raise your placards. Senator Pontes, you have the floor. Thank you. This is Repres this is Senator Pontes speaking for the first time today, of course. Just give me a big thumbs up when you're ready and I'd be happy to begin. In a tweet last October, in an effort to demonstrate his political prowess, President Trump tweeted directly at the Turkish prime minister, stating, I, in my great and unmatched wisdom, will totally destroy and obliterate the Turkish economy. It's safe to say that when we have someone with the trigger-happy mindset of President Trump, our tariff policies aren't in great hands. But this legislation makes it so much worse. First, 
we have to understand that it limits the time to decide exclusions. Today in this round, no one has brought up the specific clause that talks about trade exclusions. So allow me to be the first. When tariffs are implemented, companies have the option to file an exclusion request with the US trade representative, allowing them to be exempt from extremely harmful tariffs. The Peterson Institute for International Economics on December 19th of 2019 tells us that the USTR is extremely overburdened with $34 billion up for exemption requests that they take extremely long to process those huge numbers. In 2018, trade exemptions were released almost a year after the request was submitted. Why is this relevant? Well, Section 2A of today's legislation mandates that the whole process takes place in 45 days. Compressing a process to make it 90% shorter means companies that depend on exemptions for survival in the face of global trade wars are shut out of that opportunity. Representative Gandhi, if you're worried about the economic harms of the president using his tariffs, in this legislation, you don't take away the authority for him to lobby, lobby Congress for doing the same thing and you cut off the ability for exemption to thousands of companies, making that economic harm much, much worse. But secondly, stand with me in the negation because this still leaves final authority in the hands of the executive. Given the fact that Senator Maher is so committed to ensuring the power isn't given to the executive, it's ironic that she wants to pass this legislation. Section 2B states that the president still can render his decision and add or remove tariffs from the initial proposal whenever he wants to. We all know how that will work out. Richard Nephew, a research scholar at Columbia University in August of 2019, tells us that President Trump single-handedly leveraged tariffs in Turkey in retaliation for their detention of an American pastor. The main problem of unaccountability persists, and the current veto power that doesn't give the president the power to amend or alter the content of legislation is completely overturned. It allows the president to go in and change tariffs after getting congressional approval. While Trump's baseless claim to obliterating Turkey may have been humorous, there is nothing funny about the obliteration this legislation has on our companies. Thank you, Senator Pontes, for that speech of three minutes and four seconds. All questioners, please raise your placards. Once again, all questioners, Senator Barwa, followed Thank you. by Senator Cox. So when Trump exercises executive authority, is that in accordance with or against the ideas of the WTO? I mean, I'd argue that it's both. He's done both in the past. How is he following any type of international law if you said that he's abusing his executive authority? I mean, I'd argue he's done both in the past. We do need to regulate what President Trump is doing, right. but I'm and saying this isn't the trade, best way. We do that with trade exemptions, but how are they more accountable through Trump instead of through multilateral international? Well, okay, but today's legislation, the problem. reason it's... So if these companies are not getting these exclusionary requests like confirmed until a year later, and you say that they depend on these exclusionary requests being confirmed, then how can they wait a year? I mean, waiting a year is better than not getting it all. If you cut off the process at 45 days, you mean you're cutting off a huge number of companies right. that would even be considered. But isn't that a decision of the like the the partisan USTR anyways? So like the people who would get denied will get denied. Question time has elapsed. Please mute your mics. Thank you. Seeing as that was a speech in negation, all affirmation speakers, please raise your placards. Senator Sun, you have the floor. Thank you. That's Senator Sun, spelled S-U-N. First time today on the affirmative. Once again, S-U-N. If sound and everything is good, judges, parley, PO, whenever you are ready. Awesome, great judge. And let me pin the PO. All right, ready to go. In the 21st century, we need to wage wars with facts, not feelings. We need to carry out negotiations with leverage, not lies. It doesn't matter what you think our trade conflicts are, whether they're wars or negotiations. It is only the affirmative that can contain the conflict. 
pass today's bill to finally prioritize trade deals over trade wars. Senator Martinez tells you that there are other ways that the president can enact unilateral tariffs. I'd argue that if President Trump has multiple options, taking away one never results in a worse world if he already goes to multiple for his unilateral options. But what's important is that Section 301 is particular to trade deals. In cross-examination, Senator Slevin asks, wouldn't today's legislation make trade wars wars harder to conduct. That's absolutely false. Today's bill forces our president to negotiate in good faith because 1A prevents unilateral increases of tariffs, but doesn't prevent him from decreasing tariffs unilaterally. That means in negotiations, his only credible leverage comes with decreasing tariffs with good faith toward a trade deal. Let's use the US-China trade war as an example. CNBC explains last November that China wanted both sides to decrease tariffs as part of, of a preliminary agreement. But Reason explains that same month that President Trump rebuffed that assumption because he wanted control of the negotiations and he wanted to maintain the threat of higher tariffs. That's not in good faith of a deal. But today's legislation would have prevented him from doing so because the threat of higher tariffs no longer becomes credible if he has to go through Congress. This is empirically proven. Market Watch explains this January that the very phase one agreement signed between the U.S. and China was part of a mutual phase down of tariffs for both sides, with Trump having tariffs on $160 billion worth of Chinese in imports. But what's the impact? When you pass today's legislation, you move our country away from trade wars. Marketplace explains last November that our trade wars could cost 1.5 million jobs at home. Pass today's bill. Allow 1.5 million people to pay theirs. Next, I want to respond to negative arguments in today's debate. First, Senator Pontes tells you that the executive authority is final, but 3B says that they need to request supplemental funding from Congress in order to add codes. We'll have the last laugh. But Senator Martinez also tells you that today's legislation destroys our timeliness, but she contradicts that argument with her first one, where she tells you that there are other ways that the president can enact unilateral tariffs, namely with the Trade Expansion Act of 1962, if he deems a reasonable national security threat, he can urgently put tariffs. And I'd argue that's the only situation he'd need to do so. Turn wars into treaties. Turn conflict into peace. Or our Americans will not forgive us. Thank you, Senator Sun, for that speech of three minutes and four seconds. All questioners, please raise your placards. Senator Rosen, followed by Senator Martinez. Senator, you just admitted that the Trade Expansion Act can be invoked by President Trump to still levy tariffs. So what's the point in passing this legislation if he still has that opportunity? Two responses. One, if the president has multiple options, taking away one is never a bad thing. Two, 301, Section 301, which is neutered under today's legislation, is the one specific to trade deals. So that's where I focus my impact. Right. So even if we take that at face value, what about the other point that he can just direct Wilbur Ross to now levy tariffs unilaterally? Giving him so many options Senator still leaves Martinez it open, right? Senator Martinez contradicted her own argument when her evidence says they Senator already Martinez. told to Wilbur Ross. So are you familiar with other sections of the Trade Expansion Act? You can... Tell like me what you're Section trying to... 232, in which President Trump can basically do the same thing, but if it's a matter of national security. Right. I referenced that in my speech, actually. Yeah. So what's stopping him from doing that? Like, I don't see how your impacts are unique to this, your side. If 301, it's happen anyways. Right. 301 is particular to the negotiation of trade deals. That's where I derive my impact. The other acts that we've passed to give presidential authority have to do with tariffs actually, in general, um, but not for that. trade deals. Please mute your mics. Thank you. Please, that was a speech and affirmation. All negation speakers, please raise your placards. Senator Lee, you have the speech. Thank you, Chair. I'm Senator Lee from Virginia. Uh, please give me any indication when you're ready. I'll be sure to begin. And just as a note, is it okay if I use my phone to time myself too? Yeah, that's fine. All right. Thank you. All right. Okay. Sorry, I couldn't see the judges. In the case of economic negotiations, any action that's taken has to be prompt action. But if you pass this bill because of our political climate, the only action that becomes prompted is inaction. That's why it's so imperative that you fail this bill for two reasons. First, because polarization prevents progress. And second, because China won't back down on key concessions unless we put pressure. 
So that goes to my first point, because basically we're going to see a lot of congressional gridlock in the status quo. Because Senator Shen brought up in CrossX that there's a lot of congressional polarization and that's going to stop progress from happening. And she's exactly right. And Senator Martinez said in her speech that President Trump won't be able to pass this bill quickly. And let's see why that's happening. Because according to a February 13th, 2014 Washington Post article by Christopher Hare, polarization has been sharply increasing in the past few years. And people are more likely to only vote for their party policies rather than compromising bipartisan policies. Meaning that any hope of a trade deal between Republicans and Democrats is barely ever going to happen. Meaning that if we make Congress have a majority vote before we can pass any retaliatory action under Section 301, any hope of fast policy just isn't going to happen. Now, the reason behind that is according to an October 25th, 2019 poll from the Gallup, we see, according to Lydia Shad, that especially in trade policy, Americans are extremely polarized. And we see that the majority of Republicans, voters, by the way, are supporting of tariffs, about 62%, while the majority of Democrats at about 72% are against tariffs. We see that because American voters are more polarized in tariffs and trade policy, they're going to elect politicians who are also similarly polarized. We're seeing that in the status quo, we aren't going to have any past policy that is actually fast and efficient because in the status quo, we're not going to have any, we have a polarized Congress that that basically promotes gridlock. And so that goes to my second point because uh, Senators Mayer and um, Gandhi basically say that this bill is going to check the president. And then Senator Mayer also said that we need this bill for uh, WTO legitimacy. But the problem is if we're not passing any bills in the first place, none of that actually matters because the whole point of like passing policy is that we can make actual negotiations in the world stage. In order to have that, we need to have leverage, aka fast tariffs. Now, January 14th of 2020, the New York Times reported from Anna Swan, Swanson that China agreed to punish Chinese companies for IP theft and buy $200 billion worth of trade goods. Senator Gandhi brought up in his speech the phase one deals that we made in January. We saw they actually made really good concessions for the United States. America benefited a lot because of those trade policies, but the only reason they benefited was because we had tariffs on the table. Tariffs are our only source of leverage. And without tariffs and without fast action, we're not going to see any of that happen. And according to a February 4th, 2020 Brookings Institute article by Joshua Meltzer, we see that key market access barriers with China that were identified by the U.S. Trade Representative in Section 301 report, they're still being unaddressed. We still have main concessions that we need from China, but none of these are actually going to happen if we don't pass fair, fast, and efficient policy. We need to have unilateral, fast policy from the USTR in order to make sure that we have some negotiation leverage against China. Because in the status quo, a lot of politicians care more about siding with the blue and the red rather than siding with the blue, red, and right, red, white, and blue. And so in the status quo, make sure that we pass policy that actually works instead of policy that hampers progress. Stand with me and fail. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Sorry, thank you, Senator Lee, for that speech of three minutes and seven seconds. Questioners, raise your placards. Senator Gandhi, followed by Senator Sun. Hi. So, would you agree that tariffs create some so- sort of short-term harm, at least? Uh, yeah. But okay. I think that the long-term effects so outweigh that. Diplomatic routes instead of immediately slapping on tariffs, like presidents are prone to do. I mean, I think that diplomatic tariff, uh, diplomatic. Uh, actions, if they work, then we will be able to pursue them. But right. historically, they just happen. Would you agree that tariffs are a much more irrational and fast no. action? I, I think they're a lot more reasonable. They're a lot more, um, they, they create more action compared to diplomatic actions because they have a noticeable net harm on the other country as well. It Senator incentivizes Trump. them to change. Hi. So can you explain again how this bill decreases the president's leverage? Okay. So president, okay. What I'm saying is basically because of congressional polarization, we're going to make it so that we can't I'm pass any- it, But what prevents yeah. Trump from offering to decrease tariffs if China does the same? How is that not still leverage? Okay. Basically, in the status quo, the only reason that China's coming to the negotiating okay. table is how- because we have tariffs. Yeah, but then we offer to decrease them, and that's how phase one deal happened. Okay, yeah, but the only reason that happened, right, was because- how long we had tariffs in the first place. Okay. You're saying that Two because we're able to has elapsed, with leverage, that doesn't months. work. Thank, Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Seeing as that was a speech in negation, all affirmation speakers, please raise your placards at this time. Senator Cox, you have the floor. Thank you. Whenever my judges are ready, just a thumbs up is great. In 1974, when Gerald Ford signed the Trade Act into place, he surely did not expect President Trump because clearly he couldn't see into a future. He didn't expect an administration bent on short-term political gain at an uncalculated cost to the rest of the country, continuously damage our standing, not only domestically, 
but also internationally. That's why this Congress has to reverse the mistakes of the past and learn from them. First, pass today's legislation to rescue solar energy. The president's affinity for carbon-based energy is well known, but today's legislation prohibits him without congressional approval from using Section 301 to increase the cost of solar alternatives. Forbes magazine, May 29, 2019 reports that solar energy production costs at three cents per kilowatt hour have now become almost identical to the cost of the cheapest carbon fuels. And that's resulted in carbon-based energy losing a significant amount of the energy market share to solar. But obviously, President Trump didn't like that. And the Energy Sage website, Access This Month, explains that the Trump administration Section 301 increases on solar energy products from 15 to 30 percent, gave fossil fuels a major price break and cost Americans a quarter billion dollars in the process. But because currently this Congress has no say on the actions of 301, American consumers are stuck with higher costs and more greenhouse gases. But then Representative Pontes tells you that today's legislation will make it so that the USTR has to render an exclusion request in just 45 days instead of the years that they take in the status quo, and that will cut out companies. But the companies that really matter to our constituents in the first place don't even get these exclusionary requests confirmed anyways. The solar industry got zero exclusionary requests. So did our farmers and the steel industry. Those who actually harm our economy, uh, the tariffs that actually harm our economy are harming it for everyone. There are no exclusions. We passed today's legislation because without accountability, our constituents will have to pay whatever President Trump makes them. But then let's take a look at the other side and see how secondly, today's legislation also helps US farmers. China has struck back at US farm products with retaliatory tariffs as a result of the president's trade war. And the massive losses to US farms is just another consequence of this administration. The Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy, March 27, 2020, explains that America's farmers have been especially hard hit by Chinese retaliatory duties and Trump's 301 trade war. Exports to China alone have fallen from $20 billion in 2017 to $8 billion in 2019. Senator Lee says we need these timely tariffs to put pressure on China to change their policy. But has that really worked? Have they stopped currency manipulation or theft of our IP? I don't think so. Clearly, it hasn't worked. We need to prioritize the lives and the economy of America over the money in our Thank wallet. Senator Cox for that speech of three minutes and 10 seconds. All questioners, please raise your placards. Senator Lee, followed by Senator Blackburn. Hi, so when the trade deal passed this January, what concessions did China make to us? The, like the solving of the trade deal? No, the phase one, yeah, this January. Um, they, they didn't make a lot. No, but they also conceded IP. They're going to crack down on IP com or IP they, theft okay, from companies. But they, they also say that they're going to sanction North Korea, and then they never do. Like, I would not trust China's word. Yeah, but I mean, at least it's some policy. Like, you're saying that it's not going to happen. That's, that's not policy. That's the promise that China gives you, and I don't think it's going to happen. So how else would it work? Like, basically, we're getting leverage by taking I think we tariffs. should take them to the WTO. I don't Senator think Blackburn. we can only take tariffs by putting them on the table. Senator Blackburn. Blackburn. Okay, so why did Trump institute the solar panel tariffs in the first place? Because he values the... Um, the carbon industry, basically. Okay, but isn't it because two solar manufacturers based in the US actually asked him to do that? I think that if they did, then they were also like valuing the carbon industry. But they're solar they're panel there. companies, so how could they value the carbon industry? I, I don't really, okay. Okay, so basically what happened is that the Trump administration was lobbied and he also very clearly- But lobbied by solar panel companies in the US. I, okay, but then going against their industry doesn't Please mute your mics. Thank you. Seeing as that was a speech and affirmation, all negation speakers, please raise your placards. Senator Slevin, you have the floor. I thank the chair. My name is Senator Slevin. My pronouns are he, him, his. Um, could I just have a thumbs up from the judges whenever you're ready? Awesome. Sorry, let me just hand the presiding officer. Great. When I read this piece of legislation, an old song came to mind. I'm just a bill. I'm only a bill. And I'm living up on Capitol Hill. 
And while schoolhouse rock may be a thing of the past for us as senators, we could use a big reminder on how exactly the legislation process works. Because the framework of today's piece of legislation doesn't, can't be about one single administration or one single president. It needs to be centered on which side is more possible to pass trade policy, and that's the negation. So the only reason you're gonna to negate today's piece of legislation is because it unequivocally handcuffs the United States' ability to conduct trade policy. This is true because Congress is a terrible trade negotiator. On its best day, Congress just doesn't make sense for its job. The legislative process is just way too burdensome to conduct quick issues like trade policy and tariffs. The congressional delays that Senator Gandhi and Senator Maher say will result in more informed decisions aren't beneficial for passing policy at all. They hinder it completely. Because this Congress needs to look past its egos and make no mistake, we can barely get anything done. Senator Lee was absolutely right to point out how partisanship has increased the ability for Congress to fight while decreasing the ability for Congress to pass legislation. But again, let's go back to our best days. Let's understand how the legislation process works and how this means that it won't be able to pass trade policy at all. So let's say, for example, that China passes tariffs to put on the United States. Well, in the status quo, the executive branch can quickly and effectively respond to these. But under this piece of legislation, you need to first put a bill in a committee. There, you can a tariff organization or a lobbying organization only needs to hold eight members of that committee hostage to prevent that bill from ever seeing the Senate floor which means that the democracy, the congressional democracy that Senator Mayher champions never happens because any tariffs that we want to levy are restricted to the whims of eight of those members and their beneficiaries. But let's understand how this is only exacerbated because we're not at our best of times. Be real, the best of Congress probably happened when the Bill of Rights so Representative Maher wants to affirm this piece of legislation to increase the legitimacy for the World Trade Organization, but we achieve no legitimacy when we prevent ourselves from passing any trade legislation at all. And, and eventually, Senator Sun, you say that we need to affirm today's piece of legislation to prevent the executive from making rash decisions, but rash decisions at least are a decision that allows the United States to conduct any trade policy at all. If you affirm today's piece of legislation, you make sure that we can't respond to anything. So the next time that any foreign government decides to threaten American industry and decides to put our American citizens at risk, if you affirm today's piece of legislation, Congress will never be able to respond. That's why you negate. Thank you, Senator Slevin, for that speech of three minutes and nine seconds. All questioners, please raise your placards. Senator. Gandhi followed by Senator Mayer. So let's talk about your China example, right? How often is it that other countries put tariffs on us first? Right, so um, I mean, there's always a background level of tariffs, like tons of different countries all over the world put tariffs on the United States to protect their domestic industries. Okay, awesome. But even if they did, what is the likelihood that once you see a country put tariffs on us, you wouldn't want to do it back to them? Yeah, I mean, if you, you sure, let's say, let's say that we do want to put it back on them, right? This Congress wouldn't let that happen because- Senator Mayor. Hi, Representative, great speech. So I think you're misunderstanding the point of the legislation a little bit. Today's legislation isn't about Congress negotiating. Once we initially put tariffs into place, can't the president still have leverage over decreasing them? I mean, yeah, but that like, that argument is completely non-unique. Like under today's piece of legislation, Wait. we prevent Congress from doing anything at all. In the status quo, the executive can act. And Wait, no, also under, under today's piece of legislation, under today's legislation, the executive still has the power to act. We just initially impose the tariffs to determine whether or not that's a good because initial Congress action. He can lower them as level. Has elapsed. Please mute your mics. Thank you. Seeing as that was a speech in negation, all affirmation speakers, please raise your placards. Senator Sedlak, you have the floor. Thank you. Just give me one moment to set up. Awesome. For the judges, again, that's Senator Sedlak, spelled S-E-D-L-A-K. If you need any information from me, feel free to let me know, but I'm always ready when you are. Smile or not, and I'll begin. Perfect. 
Perfect. Waiting for the parley. Ready. Great. In 1987, President Trump released his first book, The Art of the Deal. But I'm guessing it wasn't as effective as he thought it would be because 10 years later, he had to release a sequel, The Art of the Comeback. Executive overreach on our international trade policy was a mistake. In today's debate, let's take a page out of The Art of the Comeback and pass this legislation. But first, Let's understand that today's legislation is so effective in creating better trade policy by calling on checks and balances in response to Trump's erratic trade policy. Now, Senator Martinez already told us that this legislation will only lead to the president turning to the Secretary of Commerce to unilaterally implement tariffs. Understand that point completely falls flat because only the US uh, TR has the power to unilaterally implement tariffs. But Senator Ponte says that the president still has power to unilaterally do so himself. Understand that that point is completely non-unique because that power is guaranteed by our constitution. In every world this Congress debates, the president still has this power. But you are passing this legislation because it strengthens the authority of Congress to have oversight over the trade policies that go through the executive. That is a good thing because as Senator Mayer already said, Erratic policy has already jeopardized our international relations. But understand that Trump's complete disregard of checks and balances have also started to degrade our democracy. Now beyond politicizing trade wars, as Senator Gandhi already said, on Wednesday of this week, President Trump threatened to completely adjourn Congress to expedite his federal position fillings and to expedite implementing his policy. Understand that Trump is winning his war on American institutions. Let me remind this Congress that the US Constitution gives us the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations. As long as this Congress allows the Trump administration to degradate congressional oversight on tariffs, we are failing our Constitution. We have two duties. One is to pass policy. Two is to act as a check and balance on our executive. For too long, we've ignored the latter. That can change today. Pass. But next, Representative Slevin and Conti are worried about slowing down trade policy because of the need to respond in trade wars. Understand that our chance in winning trade war actually comes with slowing down. Passing will strengthen our stance in trade wars because uh, it allows us to turn to alternative policies. Now, if I could describe the president's trade policies in three words, it would be tariffs, tariffs, and finally, tariffs. And as Representative Cox already told us, tariffs kind of suck. Uh, but Representative Lee says that the US must use tariffs if we want any chance of making change. But look to real clear policy in April of 2020, when they say that any form of war that includes tariffs with China only means that China will be able to outlast the United States. If we want any chance at winning a war with China, we need to implement alternative Thank policies. you, Senator said uh, not happens in the affirmative of today's legislation. 10 seconds. All questioners, please raise your placards. Senator Pontes, followed by Senator Slevin. Hi, Repres Hi, Senator. In this Hi. legislation, can Trump add or remove any tariffs he wants without congressional approval? I already said that argument is non-unique because in okay. every world, okay. the president has that okay. power. I understand that in Section 2B and in the Constitution, he has that power. But yeah. what good does passing oversight have if Trump can go in and edit whatever it's tariffs you put in? Thank you. In the affirmative world, Congress has more power over trade policy. That is a net good. But what power are you getting if he can still edit or add or remove he can only anything do he so puts under in. a national emergency? I understand that he can like take that to mean whatever he wants, but it still is giving Congress more power. That's a good thing. Senator Slevin. Thank you. So I Hi. proved in my speech that affirming this piece of legislation will prevent Congress from passing any form of tariffs ever. Why is that a good thing? That is actually not true at all. It only gives power to Congress to like debate and negotiate over what trade policy should look like. You're advocating for tariffs. I'm advocating for alternative policies brought up by Congress. Sure. So even if Congress brings up one of these alternative policies, does this piece of legislation let the executive act on tariffs? As I said, that point I'm is non-unique. Please mute your mics. Thank you. Seeing as that was a speech and affirmation, all negation speakers, please raise your placards. Senator Shen, you have the floor. 
Hi everyone, that's Senator Shen, spelled S-H-E-N, just like my placard. Whenever you're ready, thumbs up would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Is everyone good? Cool. U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer said, let us not make long-term decisions in the midst of a crisis. Compare that to our beloved Senate, who once so wisely said, trade wars are good and easy to win. Those two quotes themselves show the reliability of the USTR versus the Congress. But if that's not enough to convince you, look at this round in two questions. How much better is Congress and how does that affect international relations? When answered, you'll see why the only side of reason is the negation. First, fail to prevent the increase of lobbying. Senator Maher outlines in her speech that she champions congressional oversight to counteract corruption from the executive. What she doesn't realize is that's a terrible thing. Look to Section 2A, which states exclusion request processes can be done by Congress. Why is that so harmful? To put it frankly, the USTR is a lot better at doing their job than we are. Senator Cox, you argue that better handled exclu exclusionary policies will lead to less tariffs. The reality is that Congress isn't any more willing to compromise with China than Trump is. But let me distance myself from Senator Slevin, who argues that nothing will happen. Actually, Congress is going to make the status quo even worse. That's because American Oversight tells us on March of 2020 that the USTR actually increased negotiations with China to increase regulatory standards by 25%. But as a token of gratitude, Congress rigged tariffs in favor of five big corporates instead of the 300 remaining foreign businesses in the country. Senator Sun, even in your best world, where President Trump has less power, you still fail because Congress is incredibly corrupt and is not looking to end trade wars anytime soon. Senator Gandhi, you worry about politicized trade wars when you're giving the biased Congress more authority than the objectively fair USTR. Further politicization is an impact that will only be worsened on your side. Anytime we make a decision, it sacrifices virtues that legitimize our purpose, meaning that we either don't make a choice because of congressional gridlock or make a choice that isn't founded in practicality, but instead political greed. So the answer is Congress is not any better. In fact, it's worse, but it also worsens international relations because we like President Trump don't seek to end the trade war anytime soon. That's billions of dollars in losses for the economy and American businesses, especially right now. In the time of COVID-19, businesses need all the help they can get, not furthered international tensions because we can't decide to act for the people. But lastly, Senator Maher, in questioning, you told Senator Slevin you would rather Congress takes things slower. There are two reasons why you really shouldn't. First, because in Congress, literally people aren't just as qualified to make the decisions that the USTR does. Look at the public record of qualifications required. Thank you, Senator Shen, for that speech of three minutes and 10 seconds. All questioners, please rise. Senator Barua, followed by Senator Sun. Thank you. So what kind of checks does Congress have against political gridlock for the authorization of military force that is in Section 2C? Yeah, what I'm saying is that when you pass this bill, Congress becomes the check and balance for the executive. That's right. a really bad thing because- But what legislative precedent do we have as an alternative to this AUMF? So currently- It's the War Powers Resolution, right? Right. And haven't we exercised this? Hasn't our Republican majority Congress exercised this three times in Trump's presidency? Senator Sun. Hi. Do you think there's a single person in this room that would vote in favor of a reckless trade war? No. Why is Congress worse than the president? Because the Senate on history has actually worsened relations. Oh, I'm sure in history, but right now, as this Congress is assembled, who would vote in favor of a reckless trade war? The Senate. We this have time. in the past, we favored five big corporates that well, have notably been corrupt over the 300 businesses in our yeah, own who country. Do think, who do you think gets lobbied more, Congress or a president? Both, equally. Questioning president. time has elapsed. Please mute your mics. Seeing as that was a speech in negation, all affirmation speakers, please raise your placards. 
Once again, all affirmation speakers, please raise your placards. Seeing none and hearing none, we're now moving on to negation. All negation speakers, please raise your placards. Senator Rosen, you have the floor. I thank the uh, chair. Before you start, Senator Rosen, can I just ask a question to the chamber? Is there anyone else in today's session that wants to speak on the affirmation? Well, that's disappointing. Can I also just make a quick note? Yeah. Because of TOC rules, we can't have two of the same speeches or speakers on the same side. So if we don't have an app after the speech, I will be forced to move to previous question. That is correct. Great. Then with that, is everybody ready? I'm just going to pin my PL really quick. Anyone not ready? Okay, great. Trade policy accountability. It's something that we have given away over decades of lawmaking. In fact, I think we've given away so much power and so much leverage as a Congress that we don't even understand just how much we have given away. But today's legislation is simply a Band-Aid. And what we need to do is completely stitch the wound and heal it. Because what this legislation is going to do is leave open far too many opportunities for the president to levy tariffs. So first, rip the Band-Aid off and look at the reality of the situation. The central question in this debate has been, should Congress regain tariffs? Actually, I kind of side with the affirmation and say yes, but I'm disappointed and you're going to be disappointed too if this legislation were to pass. Senator Martinez already touched on this when she talked about how the president can just turn to Wilbur Ross to still levy tariffs after this passes. I want to go more specifically and look at specific laws that the president can invoke. Vox News says in March of 2018 that besides the U.S. Trade Act of 1974, which this bill is going to amend to take back our tariff power, there are three other laws that the president can still invoke. First, the trade law that is most commonly used by President Trump and that was even championed by the affirmation by, President, by uh, Senator Sun, the Trade Expansion Act of 1962, which the president can then direct the Secretary of Commerce and supersede the USTR to still levy tariffs. But there are two other laws that nobody has mentioned in this debate. The second one is the Trading with the Enemy Act of 1917, which allows the president to unilaterally levy tariffs on any countries that he deems as an, quote, enemy. And then there's the third law, which is the International Emergency Economic Powers Act, which allows the president during a national emergency to levy tariffs without Congress. Just to put that into perspective, we are in over 30 national emergencies right now. So there are over 30 reasons why President Trump or even in a year from now, a President Biden could levy tariffs without Congress because we're in over 30 national emergencies. What we have to do is go all in and not have trade policy that simply strips away one power. So Senator Gandhi, if inconsistent trade policy is the problem, this is the definition of inconsistent because you're getting rid of one small law and you're allowing three major laws that the president can still use. And Senator Sun, you even champion a law that the president can still simply use after we pass this legislation. That isn't good trade policy and none of your impacts are going to stand if there are other methods the president could use. So if this legislation does practically nothing, then what does it really do? Does it harm anyone? The answer is yes, because it leaves the executive unchecked and gives even more power to the president. Section 2B says that the USTR is authorized by Congress to remove tariffs without congressional authority. And as Scarborough International says in February of 2019, one of the last powers we still have as a Congress over trade policy is the removal of tariffs, not necessarily adding tariffs on a country, but agreeing with the USTR to remove them. Under this legislation, we completely rid of that authority. So let's say that, Senator Mayor, your legislation works and that Congress is the only one who can levy tariffs. Section 2B gives the executive the authority to strip away the tariffs that we levy, rip the Band-Aid off, look at the power that we have given away, and heal with a better solution. Fail. Thank you, Senator Rosen, for that speech of three minutes and eight seconds. All questioners, please raise your placards. Senator Sedlak, followed by Senator Mayer. Hi, Senator Rosen. How can this Congress strip the president of the power to control foreign commerce without amending the Constitution? Well, one way that we actually could limit his authority is by amending the other pieces of legislation that I mentioned that are not in today's legislation. Does that have to be mutually exclusive with passing this legislation? Well, what I'm saying is, is that if you pass this legislation, you're only going to partially fix the solution, but there's still other opportunities. So I'm if saying we have to go further. fixing the solution, what is the net harm? 
the Senator harm is that Section 2B. Representative, so the last time that the Trading Act with the enemy was used was in was in, was during World War II. And the IEEPA has only been used a single time by President Trump, who was deemed illegal by this Congress. Why does he have any incentive to do this in the future? So let's take your point of face value. What about the Trade Expansion Act that Senator Sun on your own side champions? President Trump has had no problem using the Trade Expansion Act, which isn't even mentioned in this bill. Okay, but why wouldn't we want to eliminate at least one outlet of his power, given the fact that he isn't even using any of the Well, other- as Senator Gandhi said, we don't want to have inconsistent trade policy, but that would be the definition of inconsistent. No, so we would eliminate this legislation first. Please mute your mics. Thank you. Seeing as that was a speech in negation, all affirmation speakers, please raise your placards. Senator Barwa, you have the floor unopposed. I thank the chair. That is Senator Barua speaking for the first time this legislative session. Give me any visual indication. I will begin. And Judge Two, sorry, give me just a second. Okay, we're good. Okay. After all that I've heard today, the concept of the hour seems to be cateris paribus. That's Latin for all other things remaining constant. For the negation, everything works with cateris paribus. But today, we have seen in this session how their reliance on world economics being simple and straightforward has led to the status quo. That's Latin for the mess we're in. With this legislation, we stop sacrificing the complexity of the global economy for the sake of our generalized stipulations about the benefit of the Trade Act, and we pass. But next, let me address the major issue in today's debate. That's executive power versus congressional authority. My colleague, Senator Rosen, just came up here and talked about the International Emergency Powers Act and two other pieces of legislation not spoken before. Let me bring something up that hasn't been addressed but is in the Trade Act. Section 2C states that we put a check on the president's authorization use of military force. That's so important because the president has been using this as a way to use national security, your concern, Senator Rosen, as a reason to decrease our trade relationships internationally. But where Senator Florence, uh, sorry, Senator Shen, Senator Lee, and Senator Slevin all talk about Congress being polarized and partisan to decrease our ability to actually answer to these pieces of authorization of military use, actually, our Congress has something called the Wars Powers Resolution, which gives us 48 hours to committing armed forces to military action and 60 days to put a check on any type of authorization of military use. Here's let's understand why that's so important. It's because as Senator Shen doesn't think that we're a Senate that can pr- actually vote in the affirmation to put those kinds of resolutions on the docket, we already have. This February, in for Washington, the Washington Post, Sarah Binder says that the Senate Republican majority has voted 55 to 45 to put a check using the War Powers Resolution on President Trump. That means that's the third time our Republican Senate has actually put this check on the president. We have congressional authority. We bypass partisanship when there's an emergency and we have that accountability. But secondly, let's look at the impacts that our trade has on the international scale. My colleague, Senator Slevin and Senator Sun talk about good deals and good faith. Then Senator Copps comes up and talks about US farmers and American jobs. Our impacts of our US trade trade war has had really bad effects on our international deals because the international monetary funds gathering of 89, 189 member nations this year showed that the global growth rate as a result of the trade war showed to 3%, more than ever. We need trade and codependency to mitigate this recession that we're going to see as a result of the trade war. We lose all economic resilience when we give power over to the president. Don't let this trade act power go to a political body who only wants to increase aggression instead we pass this legislation. Ultimately, we need to change the status quo and we are that future, pass. Thank you, Senator Barlow for that speech of three minutes and nine seconds. All questioners, please raise your placards. Senator Fatmi followed by Senator Shen. Hi, Representative. So let's go back to Section 301 specifically. Right now, Section 301 in the status quo allows or at least justifies any action that President Trump can take, right? 
Right. But uh, it's, it's already been established that despite, like, even if he passes legislation, he can still take retaliatory action. Okay. I don't the understand. Is there. Yeah, the le- retaliatory action we have is the war powers resolution against the AUMFs. We've done that the third right. time this year. How many countries do we trade with or that we've declared war or have AUMFs? In? We've declared war and AUMFs over oil in literally every country, almost every country in the Middle East. I don't understand how this isn't concerning okay. to you. I understand. Let me clarify something. I'm not saying that Congress isn't going to pass anything. I'm saying that they're only going to further Trump's initiatives. When you're passing this bill, Congress becomes the checks and balance, right? Yeah, but you also said that Congress has too much partisanship to effectively pull through those checks. Wait, if we have too much partisanship and we're currently conservatively dominated, doesn't that mean we're just going to- No, we don't because we actually passed a resolution jointly to protect right. our Even power against Trump. Passed a resolution, you agree that it's very partisan, right? No, it's, it's not actually. Elapsed. Please mute your mics. I Thank think you. That was a speech and affirmation. All negation speakers raise your placards. Senator Chandy, you have the floor. I thank the chair. That's Senator Chandy, spelled C-H-A-N-D-Y. Just give me a smile or nod whenever you're ready. Are we all good? Good. Good. And good. This bill gives the false notion that this United States Congress will be able to conduct itself in a more efficient manner than the USTR. There could be nothing farther from that truth. Today's legislation unnecessarily increases tension with foreign countries, and that's why we fail. But first, let's actually realize that opening hearings will lead to unnecessary provocation of foreign countries. It's a shame that as we near the end of this debate, I am the first speaker to bring this up. Senator Gandhi, Senator Sun, and Senator Sedlak stated how today's legislation actually prevents the president from making rash decisions and jeopardizes foreign relations. But under Section 1B, the office of the USTR will advise the relevant congressional committees in an open hearing on why the Section 301 investigation should occur. However, under today's legislation, we would be setting ourselves up in a tough situation because now we allow foreign countries to also hear what we know about their unfair practices. For example, At the start of the U.S. and China tariff war, the USTR conducted their own private investigation, but the president directed the USTR to challenge China's unfair trade practices at the World Trade Organization in a public platform. In response, rather than working constructively with the United States, China doubled down and retaliated by imposing unjustified tariffs on American exports. Note that China reacted solely off of rhetoric before the United States even took any actions. When you pass today's legislation, we're only going to increase tension with foreign countries before we even take action, because now they can hear our plans through these opening hearings. Yes, senators in the affirmation might argue how our president makes rash decisions, but we only allow our foreign countries to actually hear the partisanship in our Congress when we pass. But second, let's realize that today's legislation creates inadequate decision making worse than the president. Under Section 2A of the legislation, if Congress determines that offensive warrants a Section 301 investigation, an exclusion request process will be initiated. Senator Pontes talked about how the backlog issues hurt small businesses, and that's exactly correct if there's a lot of requests. But let's just say that Congress only has to deal with a fewer requests. The USTR estimates that each product exclusion request takes about two and a half hours to evaluate. Section 2A states that the office of the USTR will submit their decision making 45 days and at the worst situation, this partisan Congress could take 44 days to determine if that request is actually valid. That only leaves one day for this office of the USTR to conduct exclusion request processes and make a decision. That only halts the process and increases inefficiency. Ms. Cox talks about how today's legislation would help the solar industry, but when you pass today's legislation, we might not ever get to those exclusion requests for the solar industry because of the partisan and gr- partisanship and gridlock of this Congress. At the end of the day, you're going to weigh both the impacts of the affirmation and the negation and realize that the negation wins. Thank you, Senator Chandy, for that speech of three minutes and four seconds. All questioners, please raise your placards. Senator Sedlak, followed by Senator Sun. Hi, Senator Chandi. In the affirmative world, are we more likely to consider policies outside of just tariffs? I, would ne- I wouldn't necessarily say that at all. 
But if there's gridlock in Congress and it's going to take longer for these requests to go through, doesn't that mean we're having larger discussions about the implications of tariffs? The problem with today's legislation is now foreign countries see that gridlock through these open hearings. Yeah, but then, as you said, the president still has the ability to unilaterally uh, implement tariffs. But if foreign needed. countries are going to react much quicker. Thank you. If other countries can listen in to our, to our open hearings, doesn't that force us to act in good faith? No, not necessarily, because we're still a partisan Congress. Right, but they hear our plan, so doesn't that force us now to act in good faith with mutual interest toward a deal? I don't think foreign countries hearing our decision-making has ever impacted our decisions. And where is the impact to your first point? Wait, what I'm saying right now is that when foreign countries hear us, they're actually going to retaliate. But if they hear us after you pass this bill, now we have to act in good faith. That's not going to change our impacts or our- Why wouldn't it? Why wouldn't it change our behavior? Excuse me, question time has elapsed. Please mute your mics. Seeing as that was a speech and negation, all affirmation speakers, please raise your placards. Seeing none and hearing none, all negation speakers, please raise your placards. Senator Fatmi, you have the floor. Thank you. This is Representative Fatmi finally getting to speak for the first time today. That's F-A-T-M-I for my judges. As always, I'm at the leisure of all. Let me just quickly pin my PO. All the judges are good to go, right? When it comes to the art of trade, today's legislation, and specifically our government's trade policy, is summarized best through the Twitter bio of American poet, rapper, and my personal favorite philosopher, Lil Wayne, when he says that, unfortunately, he's always constantly under the influence, which, when you look towards the complexions within our trade policy, makes a lot of sense, considering there's no way we have to be sober to actually be able to debate it and write it all together. But unfortunately, it's because this legislation only overlooks in, in its efforts to try to fix that policy altogether that I'm asking all of you to negate. Before I begin, I wanna look at the biggest and most important debate brought up by the affirmation altogether. And that's that either Trump or the executive branch in some way or form abuse the USTR and section one policy. There's two answers to this and, this is, and both explain why this is inherently false. First, the Business Insider in August 18th of 2019 explains that the reason the USTR actually exists is to justify specifically any form of retaliation that the executive branch or unfortunate, or more fortunately enough, the entire US government takes altogether. In the status quo, any action that President Trump takes, as harsh as it may be, still has actual legalized reason behind it. I'll get into why that's a problem a little bit later on, but it's important to understand that unfortunately, consequences don't just come from President Trump, but rather consequences of passing harsh policy comes from whether it's Congress passing that policy or President Trump overall. It's non-unique to say that Trump is going to abuse the power, considering that this Congress also has a history of unfortunately abusing any form of retaliation altogether. With that in mind, let's, import, let's understand the exact comparative. The comparative to bypassing Section 301 isn't that Congress now has like a, the ability to actually look towards legislation on tariffs, but specifically that President Trump is just going to look to other acts like Section 232 of the Trade Expansion Act. Unfortunately, Mr. Sun first told you that taking away one option is better than taking away both, but that's not entirely true because when you take away one option, you make his option for section 232 the only option he has left on the table. Here's why that's such a fundamental problem. Right now, foreign policy on May 4th of 2019 explains that Trump literally utilized Section 232 to first not only establish the steel and aluminum tariffs, but also establish the, establish the automobile tariffs. Essentially, the entire trade war that the affirmation has quoted so far has nothing to do with Section 301, but rather Section 232 altogether. When you pass this legislation, at the end of the day, what it does is it forces President Trump to look towards Section 232 rather than 301. Regardless of that, Section 232 requires no justification for his actions. When we pass this legislation, all you're doing is you're giving him the go-ahead, making a blanket solution to 301, which in the status quo isn't even that much of a problem overall. So far, Representatives Meher, Gandhi, Sun, Cox, and Sedlak all have all of their affirmative impacts based on, the pre based on the fact that we're going to be able to access abuse altogether, but we're not accessing abuse of power. That is why, at the end of the day, you have to stand in negation. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Fahmy, for that speech of three minutes and eight seconds. All questioners, please raise your placards. Senator Cox, followed by Senator Gandhi, do you have a question? Okay, Senator Cox, followed by Senator 
Gandhi, is that a question? Okay. So you say that they need some legal justification under under the section that the, uh, section three hundred one basically. Yeah. But perceptually wise, is there justification for placing like so solar panel tariffs on China? Yeah. So here's the thing. I'm saying that that issue is non-unique altogether. The thing is, whether it's President Trump or Congress, when we have retaliatory tariffs because one country abused their power, it has to be harsh. That's how the U.S. established. We have to answer. We have to answer to our constituents. The USDR only has to answer to President Trump. Senator Gandhi. President Trump also answers his constituents. The president is inherently more volatile when he puts on tariffs. I'm sorry. Could you repeat that? I didn't hear you. Would you agree that the president is inherently more volatile because he has the unilateral ability to put on tariffs? Yes. Okay. So with that in mind. Sure, he has other avenues, but what is the inherent harm in cutting out one? Like we're not thinking right. about that's why my the like the second pronged approach I took to my speech was even if you don't buy the non-unique argument, understand that 301 has absolutely nothing to do with the volatile approach. The trade war started from section 232, not 301. It has time, relevance to mm -hmm. actually solving the problem. Thank you. Seeing as that was a speech of negation, all affirmation speakers, please raise your placards. Senator Mayer, is that a motion? Yes, I move to the question. Is there a second? Okay, assuming unanimous consent, we're now going to vote on this piece of legislation. All those in favor, please raise your placards. All those opposed? Representative Martinez, are you raising your placard? Okay. On a vote of five to 10, this legislation does fail. Motion. Senator Rosen. Seeing an answer break in debate, I move for a five minute recess. That requires a second. I'm gonna assume unanimous consent and it is so ordered. Please be back here at 1226. Sorry, 1227 now. Really quick, is anyone else planning on sponsoring the next one? I am. Who's? Sorry, my camera went out. I'm oh. a sponsor. Is that oh, a you want to sponsor? Yeah, I was going to sponsor, but um, sure, if you want to sponsor, go ahead. Thank you. So I think you have speaking order, so. Do we, have we taken a split on this next one? I'm going neg, I think. Okay, everyone who's AF, can you raise your placard or hand or something? One, two, three, four, six. Okay, everyone who's neg. So it's fairly split, it works. Also, not everyone will be able to get a second speech in, right? Because we have like an hour, yeah, okay.
we'll give everyone a minute to get back to their seats and then we'll get started. Did we have a pretty even split on this? I think yeah. there were like one or two more next and there were apps. Let me okay, take thanks. Uh, for the judges, I uh, just wanted to let you guys know, there's like a major thunderstorm going on in my area in Houston. So if there's like any internet connection, it's probably because of that. Just wanted to let you guys know, it's thundering pretty hard. No worries. Before we get started, I guess I just wanted to say, you know, in all the times I've been a parley, this is the first time I was able ever able to get a yogurt in between um, like parts of the round during the recess. And I kind of like this, I'll be honest, this like version of parlaying, a lot more relaxing <laughs> than uh, being in a room. All right, now that everyone's back, we can commence debate on the next piece of legislation, which is a bill to benefit Americans instead of large organizations in unsettling times. Are there any sponsors for this bill? Please raise your placards. Senator Martinez, you have the floor. Before I begin, I just wanna point out, I believe that Senator Blackburn has not returned. My apologies, you're correct. All right. Let's try that again. Any sponsors on this piece of legislation, please raise your placards. Senator Martinez, you have the floor. I thank the chair. Again, I'm Senator Martinez speaking as a sponsor for this piece of legislation. Whenever my parliamentarian, presenting officer and judges are ready, please give me a thumbs up. If you're not ready, I'll be happy to wait. Um, I know one judge doesn't have their camera on. Are they ready? Let's wait. Uh, Jared, are you there? Sorry, okay. my camera's acting up. Give me one second. Okay, for sure. No worries. Please take your time. Uh, my camera's being wonky, but I promise that I'm listening and I apologize for that. It's all right. Thank you so much. All right. I'll be happy to begin. The year 2020 has been somewhat of a dystopian reality, with CEOs taking on the role of supervillains, controlling everything we do. They control how we buy food, how we make a living, and even how we receive information about a life-threatening pandemic. For far too long, CEOs have capitalized off of our necessities to fund their wants. My legislation will mitigate the effects of this capitalist apocalypse. First, let's look at section one. My bill will apply to all publicly traded or privately owned companies with yearly revenues above 250 million that request relief. This criteria ensures it applies to the biggest companies in the US who also employ the most people, ensuring that my legislation will impact the most Americans. Now we move on to the requirements. Look to section 2A. The funds that this Congress will allocate to these companies must be used to retain employees. Consider how many Americans are already unemployed. The Bureau of Labor Statistics quantifies that as of last week, 22 million Americans have filed for unemployment. We should not let this number rise exponentially any longer. Today's legislation ensures that unemployment will no longer have to be a fear for millions of more Americans. Then we move on to Section 2B. It raises wages to $15 an hour to make up for the losses once the pandemic is over. And the issue is, is that so many Americans are still working because they fear they won't be able to pay their medical bills. But even if they continue to work, that still won't happen. As Marath and Feinstein write for the Wall Street Journal on March 20th of 2020, stating 30 
34 million are vulnerable to receiving cuts in their pay or hours, but continue to work because they fear losing any possible income if they have to pay medical bills. And then in the long term, we benefit these same employees who worry about their income through Section 2E and 2F by providing stable benefits in the long term, by ensuring dividends aren't paid until revenue is stable, and putting employees on the stock plan, protecting what many use for retirement funds. And then move on to Section 2C and 2D, in which we finally disempower CEOs, first by minimizing their salary. Let's quantify the disparity between worker and CEO. The Economic Policy Institute on August 14th of 2019 tells us, CEOs have seen a 978% increase in their compensation since 1978. The typical worker has seen a 12% increase. But CEOs can still give themselves bonuses and benefits, right? Wrong. Section 2D prohibits stock buybacks, so CEOs cannot use that money to their advantage. And lastly, in Section 3, we take the burden off of state governments that have been experiencing backlog and website crashes by giving this responsibility to the federal government. We can ensure that no one has to make a decision between paying their med medical bills or dying of the coronavirus. When I entered this office, I immediately became a representative for the working American. Let this be a reminder we are public servants for the people. Thank you, Senator Martinez, for that speech of three minutes and four seconds. All questioners, please raise your placards. Senator Chandy, followed by Senator Lee, followed by Senator Pontes, followed by Senator Mayer. Hi, hey, Senator. So if there's already a decreased demand for those products that these big businesses have, doesn't this actually make them have to lay off certain people? There's not a decreased demand because more and more people are going to places like Walmart because they need toilet paper. You Wait, know, but Walmart isn't all of the businesses we're talking about, right? No, but it, it encompasses the major businesses because I want this legislation to impact the most people. How are companies expected to pay employees like $15, which is more than they well, usually Most pay? major companies are actually raising Senator their wages already. Hi, so Section 2B of today's bill mandates that companies have to have a $15 per hour minimum wage, right? Yes. So what just like what stops them from just firing all of their workers before they take the federal funds? Section 2A, because when they request these funds, they have to retain their headcount yeah. of employees. I'm saying, why don't they fire them before they take the funds? Like what stops them? No, well, I'm saying that today's legislation stops that because they have to retain no, their headcount. No, but head that's, that's if they take the funds. I understand that. But this applies to those who take the funds. Many of these companies are going to need the funds. I'm and saying you can loophole around it by firing it. Then your funds is. Hi, Senator. So do a lot of these companies with huge numbers of employees usually pay around minimum wage? Yeah, like Walmart. Okay. So if employees receiving seven fifty today would now be paid fifteen dollars as soon as this as soon as they receive aid, um, how would these companies actually be able to pay employees this money? So this is already happening in the status quo. This just ensures the criteria. Right now, companies are doubling their wages. Oh, yeah, a couple companies are, are doubling their wages, and we're already seeing that. This just ensures- If they have enough money to double wages, why are they reaching for aid? Representatives, hi, Senator, great speech. So what's the point of Section 2E's employee stock plan when Section 2F states that dividends can't be paid to shareholders until the company has cash reserves equal to or greater than the amount appropriated by- I company? understand that. It ensures there's stability in those funds because many people use dividends for their retirement funds, and many people are seeing cuts in the dividend. Wait, sure, but none of the benefits of employee shareholding actually exist until the company can pay dividends to shareholders. Yeah, because we don't want to underpay them, and many people use those no, funds. This just incentivizes companies to keep their cash Russian reserves under the amount appropriated by Congress. Please mute your mics. Thank you. Seeing as that was a speech in affirmation, all negation speakers, please raise your placards. Senator Burns, you have the floor. I think the chair, I am Senator Burns for my judges. Just give me a thumbs up when you all are ready. The answers to today's debate can be found in the inverse of the legislation. If you try to help Americans through this bill, create a more distressing aftermath we need to negate. So first, focusing on section 2C of this legislation, like Senator Martinez, we understand that companies buying back stocks isn't currently a problem. While this Congress must understand that stock buybacks are inherently bad because they provide no contribution to the productive capabilities, 
we currently don't need to focus on this due to the fact that companies stopped buying back stocks once our current recession hit. And adding this to onto this, Congress seems to have forgotten that we've already put an end to these buybacks. The New York Times in March states that the coronavirus pandemic has brought a sudden halt to one of our corporations, America's favorite pursuits, the share buybacks, or better known as the stock buybacks. Two years ago, a tax overhaul package left this businesses flush with cash and touched off a record binge of companies scooping up their own shares, which helped push stock prices higher. Currently, this isn't a problem anymore. The spreading outbreak that has sent stocks down about 30% in the past month triggered millions of layoffs and promoted the Federal Reserve to pump trillions of dollars into the economy to prevent collapse. And companies are navigating a rapidly shifting landscape, one in which spending cash to buy back their own shares is both politically and economically untainable, such as Congress works to fashion a $1.8 trillion stimulus package for the economy, President Trump lent his support to provisions in the bill meant to block companies that receive federal money from using it to buy back shares, showing that this Congress has already proved to fix the problem at hand. Representatives, we understand that thus an entire point of the affirmations claim to help Americans fall because we have forgotten that we have already solved the issue. But second, the legislation isn't the proper way to help Americans. Focusing on Section 2B, implementing a $15 minimum wage would be terrible, like Senator Pontus briefly mentions in questioning. Jack Kelly with Forbes on July 10th of 2019 states and breaks down the unintended consequences of the $15 minimum wage, providing that most service uh, sector business have thin margins and increase in magnitude of these margins could close a company. For example, putting this $15 minimum wage into the simulation of a restaurant and finding out these tips and scales against the affirmation. To keep up with the new amount of money needed to pay their employees, business owners could choose to raise the prices of their meals. But this Congress must understand that competition with the economy, if a restaurant raises prices too high, they will lose consumers as they choose to go to less expensive restaurants who may pay under the table or deploy technology in the place of employees, decreasing the amount of jobs, while some of our constituents may benefit with the increase in earnings. Sen Senator Martinez, we need to understand that this Congress will be condemning others to unemployment. Thank you, Senator Burns, for that speech of three minutes and 10 seconds. All questioners, please rise. Senator Rosen, followed by Senator Martinez, followed by Senator Gandhi, followed by Senator Cox. So you talk about how this $15 an hour minimum wage will hurt small businesses, right? Yes, it will hold both small businesses. Right. And okay, big but business. doesn't section one say this only applies to businesses making over $250 million, meaning that impact doesn't stand? Yeah, I didn't say small businesses. So even with $250 million, they will try to cut back on employees. To Wait, make but sure a small business. Back amount of money as possible. A, a, does a small restaurant make over $250 million? I wouldn't say just that, but this applies to every single situation. If you so, have employees and you can pay them Senator less. Martinez. So you said that that stopping stock buybacks doesn't make any sense because we already stopped it from happening, right? What did Boeing just do a couple of days ago? I do not know. So basically what this Congress just implemented with the, like, the stimulus bill is that we just implemented a ban on stock buybacks. So if Boeing did this, they directly go against it and they would directly go against this legislation. So there's no difference. Why haven't we done anything yet if they didn't do it? Well, I do not know currently why we didn't do anything, but like this is non-unique. So we must pass my bill because we already have the situation. I want to go back to Senator Rosen's line of questioning. So the average small business does not make $250 million a year. Would you agree? Yes, I was just providing a simulation that could be provided throughout the entire thing. Companies that do make over $250 million, don't you think that they would be able to afford the $15 minimum wage? I agree that small businesses wouldn't. but these I would say that they would be able to afford the $15 minimum wage. But the thing is, if they can replace it with technology or pay under the table, they aren't going to try and finish the $15 minimum Automation is coming. Like, the fact is... Senator Cox... So the person that this Congress put in charge after we passed the stimulus bill to implement all of these guidelines, like preventing stock buybacks, was a watchdog from the DOD. Do you know what President Trump did to that watchdog? I am not aware. Didn't they fire them? He did fire him. And that's why places like Boeing are buying back their stock now. How do we prevent that? 
Well, Question I would say that you just put another question. Please mute your mics. Thank you. Seeing as that was a speech in negation, all affirmation speakers, please raise your placards. Once again, all affirmation speakers, please raise your placards. Senator Barwa, you have the floor. Uh, before you start, uh, Tanya, are you there? Yeah, I'm here, sorry. Okay, no worries, I just wanted to make sure. That is Senator Barwa, spelled B-A-R-U-A. Again, that's B-A-R-U-A. And give me a smile, nod, anything. Give me one second to pin my video. Awesome. Just a couple speeches ago, I talked to you about Keteris Paribus. But today, I want to talk to you about America's motto, a pluribus unum which means out of many, one. But it seems in this session, out of many, the perspective of those with privilege are the only ones taken into consideration. It's because I don't want that to happen for my American constituents that I ask you to stand with me and pass this legislation. But first, I'm so glad that our author understood and addressed the main crisis, and that's COVID-19. It's the reason why we are so disconnected that jobs like these will actually have an incredible impact on our our economy. That's because it solves our social security crisis. Now, the social security trustees report predicts that social security retirement trust funds will run dry in 2035. And that is only being exacerbated because as we just addressed in questioning, consumer spending is going way down. So our safety net for the majority of American consumers who live paycheck to paycheck is non-existing right now. But Salvatore Bobonis continues this argument when he says January 22nd in 2018 for the Institute of Policy Studies that Social Security ended by a flat tax resultant of minimum wage, which is one of the provisions in this legislation, $110,000 a year. So the more people earn with these work benefits, the more taxes they pay, and every additional dollar that we earn with this legislation will go straight to the pockets of our poor and middle income constituents. This is a doubling of minimum wage from $7.25 to an hour, which would result in social security taxes being paid by wage earners. That's a really big difference. But secondly, our first, negations, uh, our first negation colleague, Senator Burns, comes up and brings her concerns about the stock buyback options. Let me address this concern. Companies will actually still exacerbate stock buybacks because they navigate a legislative loophole that this legislation takes care of, and that's restricted shares. Restricted shares. So let's look over what happens when a company thinks its stock is undervalued, like during COVID-19. They have two options. They pay dividends to shareholders or they buy back their own shares. But this legislation places a limit on that because we actually ensure that any type of equity compensation or corporate compensation for stock buybacks stops. Because according to Ethan Tharver for Investpedia in May 17th of 2018, restricted shares and stock buybacks are awarded outright. And the owner of these shares has the same rights and privileges as any shareholder. Understand that with Section 2E, when we place workers on the same level as their corporate executive counterparts, we ensure that all stakeholders have an equal opportunity for buying stock. Now, that has a monetary value because we see that every single person, who every single single mother who's prevented from putting food on the table right now because her service jobs are being outlawed, this legislation answers her cries. We must pass. Thank you, Senator Barwa, for that speech of three minutes and 10 seconds. All questioners, please rise. Senator Burns, followed by Senator Fotme. Hi, Senator. So I was Hi. just wondering, if we increase minimum wage, how do we know and make sure that this doesn't increase unemployment? Okay, so minimum wage is resultant of the people who are on unemployment benefits right now because of COVID-19. I would argue that getting them a job in the first place weighs higher than any kind of layoff problems we'll see in the status quo. Yeah, so getting them a job in the first place. So if we increase this price, right, in minimum wage, how do we make sure that these- Because they're like, going to be, they're going to keep getting more job. service jobs. 
Hi, Senator Barrow. So when specifically talking about uh, stock buybacks, in a healthy economy, they're bad because it allows companies to artificially inflate their value. Right. right? It shows false profit. Right. But in an economy where their value is being consistently undervalued and stock buybacks allow them to retain the normal value. Okay. This retainment... This retainment of normal is a false positive or a false aura that they no. present is to Boeing increase investment. Prices right now, it's not no, right. There does not happening because of the COVID nineteen uh, pandemic. So that- that's question time has elapsed. Please mute your mics. Seeing as that was a speech and affirmation, all negation speakers, please raise your placards. Senator Pontes, you have the floor. Thank you. This is Senator Pontes speaking for the second time today. Just give me a thumbs up when you're ready, and I'd be happy to begin. When thousands of kids across the U.S. are inspired by shows like Shark Tank to take up the challenge of running and operating a business, we can truly say that the American dream is here. But just like sharks, this legislation is forcing Congress to act as a predator, fishing over the practices of our businesses, drowning them in piles of debt, and killing the organizations that have the biggest impact on our low-income communities. First, stand with me today because distributing stock to all employees will cause a brain drain. Section 2E tells us that all full-time and part-time employees have to be part of an employee stock plan. No senator has addressed what this means in this legislation. Now, during a regular economy, companies pay their employees in either stock or cash. This bill wants to make them do both. But not only that, Business Insider on February 9th of 2019 explains the concept of brain drains after recessions. Essentially, if you give your employees stock at a very low price, the stock value grows up exponentially as the economy recovers and your employees are making money. You inevitably have a period of stagnation afterwards. But what's most interesting about this process is that at that period of stagnation, a lot of employees retire because they have security of their stock. Consequently, very few workers are actually left to work in the company. The New York Times on August 15th of 2011 tells us when this has happened in the most sufficient area where we see recessions happening in 2008. The experience of Intel, who saw 17% of their employees leaving with their stock after the recession blew over, and they had to lay off 10% of their workforce just to compensate. The part of the the point of this bill is to encourage job growth. But when companies are either going bankrupt or or the ones that don't have dramatic employee reductions are not getting growth, you're encouraging destruction. But secondly, stand with me in negation because we find ourselves in really hot water when high minimum wage will force companies to lay off workers. Senator Martinez and Senator Barua champions mandating minimum wage to double under today's legislation. When I asked Senator Martinez about whether companies could afford this, she told me that companies are already doing this. But understand, as the New York Times on February 21st of 2020 explains, the reason that companies are reaching out for federal funds is because they have exorbitant costs and insufficient money. And sure, you can cherry pick the few companies that can afford it, but the overwhelming majority cannot. Congress, let's stop being predators and start being policymakers. Negate. Thank you, Senator Pontes, for that speech of three minutes exactly. All questioners, please raise your blackbirds. Senator Blackburn, followed by Senator Shen. Okay, so if workers retire from the company, what happens to the value of the company? the value of the company goes down, but you can sell out your share before you leave the company and it's gone up substantially. Okay, but the values of the shares go down too, right? As the value of the company goes Sure, down. but it doesn't matter if you sell out your share and you cash out. Right, but it's sort of self-regulating, isn't it? Because you can't have the shares high enough to support men, many workers on retirement if they all leave. But it doesn't matter what the value of the share is for an employee if it's gone up substantially to support them afterwards. Down. Hi, Senator. You seem concerned about the decrease in jobs, but you also talk about stock buybacks, right? 
I talked about employing the joint stock plan, not necessarily buybacks, but um, putting but them in a joint stock. Plan. When companies exist and they have stocks, they buy them back, right? I completely agree that that's a bad practice, and I agree well, that this legislation that addresses it. Jobs. Isn't but, that actually causing people to lose jobs? But Senator, I agree that, that stock buybacks are bad, but this legislation well, impacts well. so much more. Please mute your mics. Thank you. Seeing as that was a speech in negation, all affirmation speakers, please raise your placards. Senator Sun, you have the floor. Thank you. That's Senator Sun, S-U-N, second time today, again on the affirmative spoke fifth on the first bill if that helps. Otherwise, if everything's good, Harley, PO, judges, whenever you're ready. Great, awesome, and I'll pin the PO. From the Spanish flu to SARS, our government is often judged on our response to threatening public health crises. And today is our judgment day our moment in history. If we fail today's bill, I don't wanna see the negative 20 years in the future trying to erase their infamy from the history books. Let's ask ourselves a few questions in today's debate and determine why we ought to affirm. First, let's ask the question the entire affirmative has ignored thus far. How do companies pay for these conditions? I want to be the first on my side to establish solvency on how companies are going to pay for these conditions because Senator Martinez was asked about this twice in cross-examination. And furthermore, the entire negative has been predicated off the assumption of higher costs for companies. For Senator Burns, impact of a bad minimum wage to laying off workers, that's the impact of Senator Pontes' speech. I'd like to argue that this bill does not limit the size of bailouts that Congress can give. I'm confident that if we pass today's bill, Congress will increase the size of individual bailouts for big companies in order for them to cover the cost of the conditions we impose under today's legislation. But I'd like to prove why I'm confident. Al Jazeera explains last month that the $2 trillion coronavirus bailout make, marks a shift in political priorities because it was far bigger than the seven $100 billion bailout in 2008 and actually prioritized people. The Democratic majority in Congress had greater leverage against trickle-down approaches that governed the 2008 bailout. But the Washington Post furthers 12 days ago that the Congress and White House just met for another assistant package beyond $2 trillion. Senator Pontes draws up the analogy to 2010 and our bailout. That's because that was a no strings bailout that allowed banks to get away without any repercussions. Today's legislation is different. It finally allows us to balance companies and people through processes of negotiation that allow us to increase the size of our bailouts to those companies. Next, I'd like to argue for the affirmative on a moral front. Now is the best time that we need to fight for progressive change because we have higher leverage over companies that face bankruptcy as their only alternative. Robert Barbernick explains for Forbes that even with chapter 11 bankruptcy, only around 25% of companies actually survive. And the New York Times explains 10 days ago that public health crises have created progressive reforms in the past. A pandemic in 541 allowed workers to demand triple wages from Emperor Justinian. Now is the time that we can seize our moments. I implore every single one of you to do your job, represent our constituents, because Senator Pontes, they are the ones acting as predators over our workers. Don't censor the urgency of the problem because history never turns a blind eye. Thank you, Senator Sun, for that speech of three minutes and three seconds. All cross examiners, please raise your placards. Senator Lee, followed by Senator Pontes. So he says, right, you say right now is the best time because we have leverage over these big businesses, right? Yep. But why is this their only option? Why can't they just like fire workers, lower wages? Why do they have to take these funds? because businesses that don't take our bailouts have to eventually file for bankruptcy. And if they file for bankruptcy, it's very unlikely that they'll get the chance to actually reform. At best, it's 25%. Okay, but for, uh, further negation speakers have already established that this is gonna har harm them economically. Businesses are economic. already laying off workers. I want to try and change that. Senator Ponte. Hi, Senator. So has the CARES Act funding run out? 
um, it has. I think. Okay, so are we working on passing additional funding to support companies that have already gotten it or big companies that haven't gotten it? What I'm saying is that this Congress has shown that we're willing to increase funding for okay, the sake I of helping that. our workers. I understand that, but if large businesses haven't gotten enough and additional funding is going towards other large businesses, well, how do we ensure more. that these businesses can, we can still- We can give them more if they prove that that money goes towards the But there's a limit That's to how much money we can spend. Our time has elapsed. Please mute your mics. Thank you. Seeing as that was a speech and affirmation, all negation speakers, please raise your placards. Senator Mayer, you have the floor. Thank the chair. If y'all could just give me just a moment, it'd be greatly appreciated. Thank you. A quick question to our presiding officer. Um, what 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 do you have as our end time, Mr. Kaiser? I have one thirty, but okay. I want to add, because we did not start right at um, 8 for me. We did not start right at 8 a.m. Um, okay. Add five minutes to that end time, please. Okay. Okay, thank you. All right. Let me get thumbs up from all my judges. If you need any more information about me, just let me know. Parley. Just awesome. A 2017 study found that one in five CEOs are clinically psychotic. That's not too hard to believe, given that just last year, SpaceX CEO Elon Musk released a rap song called R.I.P. Harambe. I actually listened to it in the bathroom this morning while prepping for this very session. But in today's debate, it's actually the affirmation that's going insane, because their advocacy is contingent on flawed economics and fallacies. I'd like to be the first senator on the negation to direct your attention away from sections 2 E and F and look towards section D, which stipulates that executive salaries cannot exceed 100 times the median salary at the receiving entity, which is principally contingent on cutting corporate earnings and changing salaries. Now, section A violently contradicts this by constituting that companies have to keep current payroll and headcount levels. But let's put aside that contradiction for a moment and take section 2D at its highest ground. Senator Martinez champions the logic of tethering CEO pay to the median employer salary as a means of equalizing earnings. But let's understand that that means that a CEO who manages a multi-billion dollar retail company with employers ranging from directors to manufacturing plant workers will be paid considerably lower than the CEO of a law firm who hires only Ivy League grads at $160,000 per year. Now, Representative Sun just came up here and asked all of us how companies would pay for these conditions. And I agree with his analysis about bailouts for section two E and F, but a bailout doesn't solve for these structural disparities that CEOs are going to want to fix. They're going to compensate for these disparities that I just told you about by outsourcing their lowest employees and hiring up. First, by outsourcing the lowest employees. Baker of the Economic Policy Institute finds on June 4th of 2019 that CEOs figure out how to avoid penalties without reducing their own pay or raising the pay of their workers by outsourcing the lower wage portions of their firms to boost the measured wages of the workers that remains. In fact, the BBC finds on November 24th of 2013 that the executive pay gap in Switzerland failed catastrophically because companies outsourced their production, leading 65% of their population to vote against it. But the other way that they're going to solve for this is by hiring up or out. CBS News finds on November 25th of 2013 that regulations like the ones in today's legislation cause companies to do legal wrangling in order to continue to attract top talent in the corner office, cut full-time jobs at lower salaries, hire gig workers who don't technically count as employees, or even invest in automation. Now, I agree with Senator Barua and Senator Martinez that we live in a uniquely perilous job, in a uniquely precarious time. Representative Sun already told you that half of these companies are already facing bankruptcy in the status quo. But the imminent job cuts and inevitable uncertainty catalyzed by today's legislation is our choice. From quarantine that we face to the thunderstorms and Senator fought in his hometown, the status quo is enough to make anyone go insane. But let's not lose our minds by passing and prevent our constituents from losing their jobs and their wallets. Thank you, Senator Mayor, for that speech of three minutes and four seconds. All cross-examiners, please raise your placards. Senator Slevin, followed by Senator Chandy. Hi, so can companies afford to keep their jobs in the status quo? 
So I would say that already what we're seeing is massive layoffs. Like Marketplace found on April 29th of this year that one in 10 right. workers have already lost their jobs in the past. Yeah, for sure. But when it comes to bailing out companies, are those companies going to keep their jobs? Wait, no, they're already losing jobs in the status quo. When right, you force which them to jobs? purchase this which com- Sorry, which companies? Which companies are losing jobs? Especially those who aren't like the big Walmarts and the massive corporations who can't- Right, and doesn't this piece of legislation only apply to those- Senator companies? Kennedy. Okay, so now companies can't actually buy back their own stocks. Wouldn't this actually increase their assets then? No, I don't think so whatsoever. Because, Wait, because now they're not actually giving so much money to top executives, right? No, I understand that they're not giving as much money to top executives, but you still have that disparity between the CEO and the other workers. The they only do. way that they do that is by outsourcing. That's what they've done in the past, even in countries like Switzerland, which have these laws in place already. Can't they just reinvest the money that they are saving from actually not buying back like stocks no, and then reinvest it in their they're, they're already cutting more jobs. Can- time has elapsed. Please mute your mics. I think you. Seeing as that was a speech and negation, all affirmation speakers, please raise your placards. Senator Slevin, you have the floor. Apologies, Senator Cox, you have the floor. Thank you, whenever everyone is ready. The current $500 billion stimulus package is supposed to represent transparency and accountability. That's why we gave the guidelines to a seemingly nonpartisan watchdog in the DOD in order to ensure that this stimulus package actually reached our people. But then in pure President Trump fashion, he fired the DOD watchdog. So now this Congress is left to our own devices. I beg you to stand in affirmation of today's legislation because it is the only chance we will ever have at finally fixing our wrongs. But first, pass today's legislation because it prevents stock buybacks with stimulus funds. Today's legislation ensures that the $500 billion goes where it's needed to support economic recovery, not to enrich stockholders and the corporate elite. And I wanna clear something up in today's round about stock buybacks because they don't actually help the company in the long term, but who they do help are the senior executives of the country, of the company. Harvard Business Review, January 20th, 2020, explains that stock buybacks take the stimulus funds that companies have been given for payroll and investment in long-term growth, and then they use that to buy back the stocks in the open market. And these buybacks only increase the value of stock falsely and the options held by investors and senior executives. Buybacks don't help the growth of the economy nor of the company. They become shaky and weak from a lack of working capital. But then Senator Burns comes up here and tells you that this Congress has already prevented stock buybacks with our previous stimulus package. But that's not completely true. Those preventions were guidelines that were supposed to be implemented by the DOD watchdog that I just mentioned. And when Trump fired him, as Ms. Martinez brought up, Boeing and other companies started to buy back their stocks once more. This is all about greed, about taking the money and running. Today's legislation is the only chance we have to bring that money to the, to the constituents. But second, I'd also like to take us back to what Senator Martinez briefly mentioned in her speech about how today's legislation limits executive salaries. Because over the past years, the compensation of the rich has grown dramatically while average worker income still remains flat. AFL-CIO Paywatch access this month revealed that the average top executive compensation of the S&P 500 companies was a $14.5 million or 287 times the average company employee pay. But this legislation finally in section two only limits that to a hundred times. But then Senator Mayer comes up here and tells you that CEO sal- they won't want to work for the CEO salary under today's legislation. And so instead they'll start to outsource the lower paying jobs for their employees. I'm gonna be honest with you. I don't really know how that process works, how you outsource a janitor job, but if they don't want to work, find someone else who will. Pass today's legislation for constituents. Thank you, Senator Cox, for that speech of three minutes and nine seconds. All cross-examiners, please raise your placards. Senator Burns, followed by Senator Fotme. 
Hi, Senator. Um, I'm just a little confused. So when you say that we fired Inspector General Glenn Fine, I understand that. But do you know that we actually hired someone just this week in place of him? Yeah, and that someone is very privy to whatever President Trump wants him to do. Okay, so how do we understand that like we can provide the correct oversight with today's bill? Right, so today's legislation puts the Department of Labor and the Treasury Department in charge. It's a lot harder to fire an entire department than one watchdog. Okay, but I don't understand. Senator fought me. Hi, Ms. Cox. So on the topic of stock buybacks, the reason country, or excuse me, companies do stock buybacks is so they can increase or like at least benefit investment, right? Which helps the executives, yeah. Right, but in the point in which we're in a recession, doesn't just trying to re like gain the value they had before allow investment safety, which allows benefits towards our consumers? I honestly don't believe in any stock buybacks or good ever. So it doesn't help in consumer safety at all. Falsely increases the stock. Does consumer of investment if safety? We're in a recession. The company has to hurt too. Thank you. Yeah. Question time has elapsed. Please mute your mics. Thank Seeing you. as that was a speech and affirmation, all negation speakers, please raise your placards. Senator Blackburn, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Uh, if the judges could just give me a thumbs up when you guys are ready. Um, this will be my first and probably only speech this session. Pio? Thus far in the debate, Senators Martinez and Son on the affirmation have talked about the benefits of a $15 per hour wage, while Senators Burns and Pontus and other speakers on the negation have talked about the financial burden that this places on companies. So in this debate, it comes down to weighing wages for workers against company health. But the negation wins because we can do both at the same time. It's because first, this bill is completely non-unique, and second, the affirmation arguments against stock buybacks don't hold water that we negate. But first, we negate because this bill is completely non-unique, and that's because the wages it provides for workers are less than the wages that they are currently receiving from unemployment benefits. Eric Levitz of Intelligencer in March 2020 writes that the recent stimulus bill increased unemployment benefits by $600 per week, but $600 per week is equal to what a worker with a $15 per hour job makes in a 40 hour work week. That means that currently unemployed retail workers who make up the majority of uh, employees at these large corporations are making more than what this bill mandates they be paid. In addition, Dylan Matthews writing in Vox in 2020 writes that any relief loans given to small businesses already come with a requirement that the money be spent on payroll, benefits, utilities, rent, and mortgage payments. In fact, if benefits maintain current payroll levels, as this bill is requiring them to do, their, their entire loan will be forgiven by the government. So the government has already provided the aid that this bill seeks to provide. Now, this bill does have uh, one non-unique provision in reference to wages. Section 2A mandates that existing payroll levels be maintained. That means that for high wage workers, they can keep their high salaries. But I would argue that the priority for relief funds shouldn't be to keep lawyers and surgeons at $500,000 per year, and the affirmation would agree. In the negation wor world, workers get their wages, and companies also aren't broken because they aren't the ones that have to pay the workers. But second, we negate because the affirmation arguments against stock buybacks simply don't hold water. Now, first, Senators Burrow and Cox talked about how this bill is preventing stock buybacks, but stock buybacks simply aren't a bad thing. When companies buy back their stock, they are simply investing in their future return, the same way any other outside investor would do. According to Erica York of the Tax Foundation in 2018, it's the cash that's left over after capital and investment expenses that is used for these buybacks. So the only other option is for the cash to sit idle. Next, Senator Cox told us that stock buybacks artificially increase company value. But according to James Chen of Investopedia in 2019, this is only true when the shares are at already are already at equilibrium price. If the shares are artificially low, as they are during the recession we are currently in, then stock buybacks merely increase the share value to its real value. It's because first, this bill is completely non-unique in the benefits it provides to workers. And second, the affirmation arguments against stock buybacks don't hold water that we failed today. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Blackburn, for that speech of three minutes and two seconds. All questioners, please raise your placards. Senator Sun, followed by Senator Rosen. Thank you. So you talked about how one section of this bill is non-unique. Does that make every other subsection non-unique? 
I'm talking about the sections relating to the uh, wages paid to work. Right, there are other sections of the bill. Does that make other sections non-unique? No. So, for example, the employee requirement, 100 times employee, that's not non-unique. That would also fail for the reasons explained. Okay, so moving on, are you suggesting that we want people to file for unemployment? That's what the stimulus bill is assuming. It's assuming that like, people- Do you want to keep your job? <laughs> it's not about what we want. It's about what's happening. You're condoning that people file for unemployment just because they get the living wage. Why not just give them the wage? So I don't really see the problem with, as you admitted, a $15, $15 an hour minimum wage equaling unemployment benefits. So what's the harm here? Because, okay, so in the negation world, what happens is workers get paid their $15 an hour and companies okay. don't have to pay that out of their own pocket. In the affirmation world, we were they still get that 15 Wait, why dollars. don't they have to pay it out of their own pocket? They're receiving a bunch of bailout money, billions of dollars. Uh, the unemployment benefits come from the government. They don't come from the funds paid to the Right, company. but all I'm saying is if you said that wages are going to be hurt, but then you say that they're equal. So which one is it? That's what I'm trying to understand. Questioning time has elapsed. Wages are non-unique. Right. Companies are not hurting. Questioning time has elapsed. Thank you. Uh, Since point of speech negation, all affirmation speakers, please raise your placards. Off of recency, that is going to go to Senator Slevin. I think. Point of think. inquiry. Yes. Uh, questions. Wait, just just double checking. It's questions are precedence and recency, right? Or did you say precedence then recency? Precedence then recency. Okay. Thank As you. in, if you've yeah. like asked less questions, I'll pick you before. But if you've given a question more recently, I'll pick on the person that's given the question less recently. Thank you. All right, for the chamber, my name is Senator Slevin, speaking for the second time this session. Uh, if I could just have a thumbs up whenever you're ready. Awesome, thank you. Last month, this Congress passed the CARES Act, and I think of it as a reverse Robin Hood situation. It steals from the poor in terms of using taxpayer money to bail out companies and then gives to the rich by giving them massive amounts of bailouts and then barely saying where any of that money has to go. But you can change that narrative under today's piece of legislation, because although we can't take that money back, we help decide where it goes. So that's why it's important. Allow me to be the first one in today's debate to attach actual impacts to this round. What happens to the average American family when you affirm today's piece of legislation? Well, you save lives. This is true because this bill raises the minimum wage and thus decreases the suicide rate. The economic impact of coronavirus has put a lot of stress on low-income American families, and that stress has unfortunately translated into higher rates of suicide. According to Dr. Ken Duckworth, the chief medical officer of the National Alliance of Mental Illness, on April 7th of this year, economic instability and unemployment have been linked to an increase in suicide, especially for those barely struggling to make ends meet. But we can fix this under today's piece of legislation by raising the minimum wage. Because according to the New York Times, on January 14th of this year, just a one per $1 increase in the minimum wage would reduce the suicide rate by as much as 6%. So the impact on American families when you affirm today's piece of legislation extends beyond their wallets. It extends to their lives. But the solvency of this idea has been brought up by every single negation speaker. But allow me to explain how exactly this piece of legislation will save lives. Senator Pontus and Senator Maher say that companies simply can't afford to pay for the stock plans and raising minimum wage. But that's not actually true, because according to Bloomberg, on March 16th of this year, American airline companies over the past decade have spent 96% of their free cash flows on stock buybacks, meaning that the reason that they choose not to raise the minimum wage isn't because they fiscally can't, but because they'd rather not. Under today's piece of legislation, you prevent stock buybacks and you force companies to raise the minimum wage. So that's how you're going to save lives. And then next, Senator Burns say that stock buybacks are few and far between during a recession. But that was only true when companies were initially suffering. After we passed the CARE Act, the American airlines industry alone got $50 billion in cash to do with whatever it pleases. So once they have this cash, they're free to buy stocks again, and you see the same exact problem. And finally, Senator Blackburn, once you attach the requirements to how companies spend their money, you see financial security for families increase, and ultimately you save lives. So from one Isaac to another, understand that the only choice is to affirm today's piece of legislation.
this is like a reverse Robin Hood situation where the lowest income Americans are getting hurt while the highest income Americans benefit. So you're going to pass today's piece of legislation to return the money to the Americans. Thank you, Senator Slevin, for that speech of three minutes and 10 seconds. All cross examiners, please raise your placards. Senator Sedlak, followed by Senator Blackburn. Hi, Senator Slevin. As one of the last speakers on the affirmation, I'm going to ask a question that I don't think has been answered by the affirmative side. How does today's legislation safeguard our workers to having a job to go back to after this crisis? Right. So it safeguards our workers in a number of different ways. First of all, Section 2A makes sure that companies have to spend this bailout money on retaining workers in the first place. So you're not going to see as many workers having to go back to their jobs because they keep their jobs in the first place. Yeah, definitely. But can't they use that same money to invest in automated technology or outsourcing the same workers? No, because all of the other... Tom Hazelops, next senator. Uh, okay, so a company like McDonald's has a yearly revenue of over $250 million, right? Yep. Okay, so what is the cost of like a robot that can do a comparable job compared to a McDonald's worker? Yeah, well, so the bailouts we're seeing in the status quo aren't enough money to simply reinvent a workforce. They're just enough to help that company stay afloat. So when you attach restrictions to how that money is used, you're going to make sure that companies spend it on workers. Right. But if a $15 per hour worker is more expensive than a $13 per hour worker, won't we see a decrease in employment and a rise in suicide rates? No, you're not going to see that at all because for the rest of the world- Question time has elapsed. Please mute your rights. Thank you. Seeing as that was a speech and affirmation, all negation speakers, please raise your placards. Senator Gandhi, you have the floor. I thank the chair. This is Senator Gandhi, still spelled G-A-N-D-H-I. As always, any indication when all of you are ready, and I will get started. Awesome. Awesome. Across the thousands of companies in the US, their boards and CEOs have frequently relied on buzzwords and dog whistles to convince us that they care about the average person rather than their bottom line. But today's legislation under underestimates their ferocity and the cunning of those same companies and postulates our ego to overestimate the power of this legislation because it is an arrogance of a body too full of itself to think about the devil in the details. Today's legislation is fueled by good intentions, but buttressed by ignorance and a misunderstanding of how our businesses make their millions. In today's sponsorship, you got the major argument from Senator Martinez, where she focused on criticizing CEO pay at unholy amounts that Senator Sun and Slevin champion. Senator Meyer gave you the moral argument of why this isn't a good idea and how CEOs could also outsource. But let me explain what the CEOs themselves can do and why that's a reason you flip to the negative. Because not all things CEOs get is salary. Senator Cox, to cite the very same S&P 500 companies that you did, Stanford University explains in 2018 that in those companies, CEO compensation packages are dominated by incentive-based pay. Only 13% of total compensation is salary-based. The other 87% is things like stock and options, whose ultimate value depends on performance. So the result of this is, even if you have a salary cap on executives, companies just give other forms of compensations like stocks. So corporations, if you pass, will be willing to cut more salary and turn it into stock options or remove it entirely because the incentive-based pay is what keeps CEOs doing risky things so they can reap the rewards when they win big and just shift the cost down when they fail. So even in the best case, this just leads to CEOs buying more equity in their firm, which allows them to retain the same level of pay without internalizing the millions in worker cost increases that Section 2B and D require. So Senator Martinez and Cox, considering the very CEOs that you demonize so much, it seems reasonable that corporate America would be willing to shortchange the entire middle class if they just needed to spend an afternoon playing with their executive pay. But this also means that executives will be more incentivized to engage in short-termism because Columbia University explains in November of 2010 that using a data panel of over 117 firms over 13 years, researchers found that increasing stock options and compensation increases the probability risk of default by 13%. So Senator Sun, this means that you're going to see more corporate debt and the very bankruptcy that you're trying to avoid. So the millions of people that Senators Martinez, Barua, and Sun champion protecting from those harms and the ones that Senator Sun wants to save from suicide are just placed at more risk because their firms are at a higher risk of defaulting. But let me be the first negative speaker to address Senator Barua and Cox's claim that placing a ban on buybacks is a net positive in the context of the pandemic. Here's the thing, 
buybacks are the only way you can use your money productively right now. If you literally can't sell your products, open your stores, get your factories turning out products because of social distancing, you don't have a choice other than to buy back. You can't use your money. So Senator Martinez, even if you want to demonize CEOs in the United States, the affirmative needs to contend with the fact that today's legislation paints in broad strokes without considering that action without commitment and decision without consideration will only undermine the principles that we stand for, not rectify them. Thank you, Senator Gandhi, for that speech of three minutes and four seconds. All questioners, please raise your placards. Senator Martinez, followed by Senator Barua. So after the 2008 recession, when companies were buying back stocks, what did they use for that money? Right, okay, but I think you're considering it in a bit of a different context, right? Like that recession isn't equal to the recession right okay, now. But wait, what I wanna ask is, do you know where CEOs get their benefits from? From stock companies. From stock buybacks. So when they buy stock buybacks, they can give themselves compensation outside of their salary. My legislation stops that. How is your point still right. stand? But here's the problem. Companies can't do anything else right now. Like Senator Barrowa. Thank you. I want to be the first affirmative speaker that acknowledges these equity compensations that you talk about. But what's happening with investment and consumer spending right now as a result of COVID-19? Why don't you tell me? So there's no consumer spending because people are having quarantine orders and don't have any outreach to businesses, right? So how is equity compensation having any effect on corporations that you impact to? No. So, okay. So what I'm saying is that if you tie CEO pays, if you create- Right, but you talk about equity compensation. That's not happening because we have no- Please mute your mics. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing as that was a speech of negation, all affirmation speakers, please raise your placards. Off of recency, that goes to Senator Shen. Hi, everyone. That's Senator Shen, still spelled the same way, just like on my placard. If it helps you, I spoke 10th on the last piece of legislation. Whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me just see the PO. Cool. Throughout all the words said in this round, there have been a couple things made super clear. First, companies are very corrupt. But second, this Congress is making excuses for a lack of action on it. Let me boil the affirmation down really simply. I've heard more terminology in this one round than I knew existed in my lifetime. But let me make something really clear. We aren't passing for the economy or decreasing executive corruption. We're passing to protect the people we serve. So first, affirm to protect American workers. Let me distance myself from Senator Cox, who impacts stock buybacks to helping executives. In reality, it's so much more than that. Senator Blackburn says that buybacks are a good thing, and Senator fought me asked him questioning if it helps companies. The answer is that it's actively hurting them, because the trend now is to not just use your excess cash to buy back your stocks. Companies are literally saving money specifically for it. That's really important, because the negation assumes that the buybacks operates exclusively on the assumption that it's good because it's just excess money that the country doesn't know what to spend it on. The sh that shows that the status quo is far worse than what the negation is painting. Let me show you exactly how heinous it is. How much are they spending? CNN Business quantifies in 2018 that U.S. companies have spent over $5 trillion to buy back their own stock in the last decade alone. But what is the impact of that? It's specifically that it hurts workers. Business Insider tells us on January of 2018, the company that makes Huggies and Kleenex spent $900 million on stock buybacks. As a result, it cut over 15% of jobs, shutting down 10 factories, leaving 5,000 people jobless. Senator Burns, you make your entire argument off the basis that buybacks are being stifled currently due to the coronavirus. Two responses to that. When the pandemic ends, companies begin their practices again. But also, it actually flips your impact about the decrease in jobs, because the longer we let stock buybacks continue in the status quo, the more jobs we're leaving at risk. And Senator Gandhi, you say that it helps companies. Thousands of people lost their jobs as a result of stock buybacks. It might help the corporations, but it's clearly not helping the people. That's what's most important. 
But second, let's address the main points of contention on the negation. Senator Pontes, Burns, and Lee in questioning champions the idea that a higher minimum wage leads to unemployment. Let me put those concerns to rest. The National Employment Law Project tells us in 2015 that the bulk of rigorous research examining hundreds of case studies of minimum wage increases finds that raising the minimum wage boosts income for low paid workers without reducing overall employment or job growth to any specific degree. Don't let the negation confuse the debate with complicated ratios. We are passing for the people. Thank you, Senator Shen, for that speech of three minutes and nine seconds. All questioners, please raise your placards. Senator Lee, followed by Senator Rosen. Hi, so can you restate your analysis on why people aren't going to get fired because you're increasing the minimum wage? Yeah, there's plenty of reasons for it. First, because it increases like worker quality. Second, because when it increases worker quality, it increases their profits. So they We're have- In the middle of a coronavirus outbreak, does worker quality really matter? Like, aren't they just yeah, focusing on retaining workers? Because that affects the quality of the product. Yeah, but you said it yourself, business activity is down. Like there's no one to sell it to. Right, but it also doesn't matter necessarily during this time. In the long term, it's going to be good. But Senator it's Rosen. Would you say that, or would you agree that large corporations need to take bold action right now to save their employees and keep them in the workforce? Large would you agree? Yes. Just It's just a yes or no. Do they yes. have to keep their, right. So if they have, want to keep their workers, don't they need to retain equity through stock buybacks in order to make those decisions? Oh, I understand what you're saying. Here's the problem. They have way too much equity already in the status quo. It's literally- hate. What about, what about for those need- that don't? Huh? There are some companies that don't have enough equity to make those decisions. So what about those companies? We don't have to worry about that for okay. long. Really? Okay. Your mics. Seeing as that was a speech in the affirmation, all negation speakers, please raise your placards. Senator Lee, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. This is Senator Lee. Give me any indication when you're ready, and I'll be sure to begin. Fitting how an unsettling bill or a bill for unsettling times is unsettling itself. I'm gonna do something that no one else in today's debate has really done. I wanna analyze this impact of both the affirmation and the negation in terms of length. Because the problem with this bill is that it's extremely vague in how long these restrictions in section 2A are gonna last. And so I wanna break it down in two scenarios, a short-term restriction or a long-term restriction. So let's go to the short-term first. Basically section 2A and 2B of today's bill make it so that we have a federal minimum wage of $15 per hour but also says that we can't fire any workers or lower any worker wages. Now that has a bit of a contradiction because now we're having a lot of economic strain on these businesses. Now, Senator Burns, Baru, and Pontes already emphasized and established that businesses aren't gonna suffer without with a $15 minimum wage. But allow me to further quantify that because the July 2019 Congressional Budget Office report states that raising the federal minimum wage to $15 per hour would cost 1.3 million American jobs. But here's the difference these aren't actually gonna lose American jobs. That's something that that everyone in today's debate has really mistaken because section 2A actually prevents you from losing jobs. But that's the biggest problem because when you're not allowed to fire people, but you're actually supposed to increase their wages, you're gonna have more economic strain on these businesses. That's a really big problem because as Senator Sedlak mentioned in CrossX, there's no way to retain or to make sure that these workers are going to have retention in the future. Because after the short term, uh, after these short term restrictions end, these businesses are going to fire their workers. And the reason behind that comes from April 18th, 2020 World Economic Forum report. We see that the post COVID 19 economy is projected to bring severe economic turmoil because there's no, there's, there's a lot of uncertainty in the economy about whether or not coronavirus is going to research, meaning that there's a lot of low consumer confidence, meaning that the economy and the business gets harmed as a result meaning that after the short-term restrictions, businesses are going to have to fire employees because they have no other choice. The economy is too bad, and this bill only exacerbates the amount of restrictions that gets placed on top of them. Now, Senator Barrowa says we'll get more jobs, but literally the exact opposite thing thing happens when we're forcing this kind of economic strain onto businesses, and then we just take it off after short-term restrictions. But now that I talk about the short-term restrictions, let's focus more on the long-term restrictions. Now, this assumes that basically these restrictions from Section 2A are going to be indefinite, and it doesn't really matter because we're going to have to wait until the, res- the economy starts recovering as a result. But we have to understand that that's also going to hurt businesses because Senator Sun says we have leverage in the status quo, and that's why we need to pass the bill. But that's not true because businesses don't have to take this bailout. Okay, March 26, 2016, uh, 2020, New York Times report sta- states that big businesses are unwilling to accept government aid if it means they're giving too much government control to the government. 
Now, this means that in terms of equity stakes, if they give too much control to the government, they'd rather do they'd rather do other things to uh, to avoid bankruptcy. They'd rather do like either cutting jobs, lowering wages, moving overseas, buying back stocks. Their options are still plentiful. They don't have to take the bailout that this government is basically proposing on them. And like Senator Martinez said, but Boeing is buying back their stocks. But even if you pass the bill, that's still going to happen. We're seeing that in the short term, in the long term, both paths fail for our con constituents. And that's the reason why you have to fail this bill. Stand with me. Let's stand in the negation. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Lee, for that speech of three minutes and nine seconds. All questioners, please raise your placards. Senator Shen, followed by Senator Chandy. Hi, Representative. What's of today's bill said? Uh, let me bring it up really quickly. It says that basically uh, they're prohibited from buying back stocks. Yeah. Right. So you said if Boeing is buying in the status quo, passing won't change that. How yeah. would it not if Section 2C literally says? I'm, because I'm saying in the long term, it's not going to help them. They're not going to accept the deal. So this bill doesn't apply to them. Is encoded into law. I, into I'm saying that Boeing isn't going to take the funds because this only happens if you take the funds. That's what but Section 1 says. One so that take the completely slashed. Hi, Senator. Can you explain Hi. to me again why companies would actually go bankrupt rather than take a bailout again? Because they're not going to go bankrupt. They have other options. That's what oh. I was trying to say. It, why? They because really you can always lower wages. You can always fire workers. You can move overseas. You can buy back stocks. You yeah. don't have to take a bailout. When you decrease workers, you're only per, like going towards the path of bank bankruptcy. Especially for bigger companies, they have the they have they can afford to basically take other options. They don't need a ba bailout from the government, Wait, especially when it imposes this many restrictions onto them. It's just going to more economic harm. Please mute your mics. Uh, really quickly, let me address the parley. So, um, can we start a speech before one thirty-five, or should we finish the session now? We have time for one more speech. Okay, great. Since that was a speech negation, all affirmation speakers, please raise your placards. Off of recency, that is going to go to Senator Rosen. I thank the chair. This is Senator Rosen speaking for the second time this session on the affirmation of the bailout reform legislation. And if my, I'm just going to pin my PO real quick. And if my PO could let me know if everyone's ready, that'd be great. Everyone good? Today's debate has been marred by misconceptions. And while we've had the negation predicate these misconceptions, we have to put them flat because they've been going on for far too long. I'm gonna get right into things as the last speaker in today's round to knock down some of the major impacts that are still standing and maybe are weighing in your decision to side with the negation. And we're going to, under, going to understand how the affirmation clearly wins. First, I want to start off with Senator Burns, who brings up her first point in today's round on the negation, which is that corporations aren't even buying back stocks in the status quo. So 2C is completely useless. useless. She even says that we already banned stock buybacks in the CARES Act, but that couldn't be further from the truth. ProPublica says in April of 2020 that the CARES Act did not ban stock buybacks for corporations that received bailouts from the government. Actually, what the CARES Act says is that the Treasury shall, quote, endeavor to make sure that bailout companies maybe don't take stock buybacks. They go on to say that this is such a weak accountability metric that Boeing and United, after they said that they're going to receive bailout money, said that they're going to continue with stock buybacks, which United has done for years and years on end. So what you have to understand is the CARES Act doesn't have accountability over stock buybacks. So if that is weighing in your decision, understand that you're going to flip that to the affirmation. But then Senator Burns goes on to say that a $15 hour wage isn't affordable for small businesses. My response to that is that she's exactly right. That's why we have section one of this legislation. It exempts small businesses. But then she goes on to say in questioning with, Sen in questioning with her, she said to me that large corporations also can't afford this $15 an hour wage. And Senator Pontes also echo echoed that in her speech. But CNBC explains in March of 2020 that Delta, Southwest, GM, Chrysler, all who are receiving bailout money already paid their workers well above $15 minimum wages, including GM, which paid their workers over $40 an hour. But now after receiving bailout money, they're cutting wages by over 50% in some cases, which will make it lower than $15 an hour. If they're going to get bailed out on the taxpayer's dime, they should afford to keep wages up. So clearly that point doesn't stand. Then Senator Mayer goes on to say, 
that corporations are just going to outsource low salary workers to make sure that executive pay increases, because that's kind of what this bill is based on. First, her evidence didn't even mention one example of U.S. corporations that used outsourcing. Second, the only example that she mentioned was in Switzerland. And as far as I'm concerned, the CARES Act doesn't bail out Swiss cheese. But let's go on to talk about how even if we take her point at face value, corporations aren't going to outsource. The Seattle Times explains in February of 2013 that corporations like Boeing, which are receiving CARES Act bailouts, have tried outsourcing in the past. It failed so miserably that they had to stop production of Boeing Dreamliners in 2013 because of major security risks. And then after that, it stood as a lesson to other manufacturers not to try outsourcing again. So clearly, they're not going to be turning to this method. And lastly, I want to address Senator Blackburn's point that a $15 an hour wage is somehow less than unemployment. He even admitted in his speech that they're equal. So that point doesn't stand and workers would rather be paid $15 an hour than not have a job at all. Clearly in today's debate, the affirmation is one that you should be voting for. So affirm. Thank you, Senator Rosen, for that speech of three minutes and eight seconds. All cross-examiners, please raise your placards. That's going to go to Senator Burns and then Senator Pontes. Hi, Senator. So I'm talking, I'm going to ask you about your first point, which is minimum wage. So you say that large corporations are taking bailout money, and this is why they keep employment. But Representative Lee already stated that these companies do not take bailout. So what are you trying to say? What I'm trying to say is that for the companies that are taking bailout, they already had wages well above $15 an hour. So clearly when they have the capital, they can, companies just, who just let me finish really bailout. quickly. All I'm saying that unemployment doesn't like solve. Okay. So what I was trying to say, Senator is that, hi, Senator. So I want to highlight a portion of the bill that every affirmation speaker has ignored, giving every employee stock. If I told you that this leads to retirement and layoffs, why do you still advocate for it? Well, I wasn't focusing so much on the stock plans. What I'm trying to understand is why some of the impacts are still standing in today's debate that are okay, completely misconstrued. I, I understand that, but you're still advocating for giving every employee stock. And given okay, that so only actually, leads to right. negative- Based on your point, again, you didn't mention one example of a corporation similar to Senator Mayer. If you actually have examples of corporations that were going to see these trends what as you talked about in your speech, that? then that point will stand. Please mute your mics. Thank you. Seeing as unfortunately we have run out of time, I will be forced to call for orders of the day, which triggers the previous question. So all those in favor of today's legislation, please raise your placard nice and high. Okay, all those opposed. All right, on a vote of nine to seven, this bill does pass. Really quickly, I just wanna say thank you to everyone for letting me preside this session. Once again, my name is Representative Kaiser. We got through 27 speeches and 58 questioning blocks this session. We passed one bill, but failed to the other. And I really just wanna wish all of you to stay safe and healthy during these trying times. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kaiser. So to the whole room, overall, great first round. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, you know, showing everybody exactly what TOC is supposed to be. I appreciate that. So um, with that in mind, we're gonna let the, everybody can start exiting now. The judges will turn in the rankings and yada, yada, yada. Um, please everybody be back here at, it looks like 11.50 my time which is California time. So, yeah. Um, is there any questions before we break from anybody about what's going to be happening next round or are you guys all good? Okay, sounds good. I'll see you guys at the beginning of the next round then. Thank you. And thank you to our judges for taking the time to judge this round. Thank you.